Patterson and Michael Remus. What is up, everybody? Let's get it going. It's Friday afternoon. Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. I'm Andrew Patterson along with Michael Remus. Don't worry, it's just a Diet Pepsi, but it is being held in this beautiful Winnipeg Sports Talk koozie, which, um, yeah. We had a pretty good summer, a pretty amazing summer, with the exception of if you're a farmer and have been needing the rain. Uh, it looks like uh, time has finally caught up on us, and we're going to have a rainy weekend, just as I was planning on having the boys out for a golf weekend. Oh, well, it's great to see the rain coming down, and uh, we will get through it. Um, got a lot of sports to watch this weekend, including some big games in the Canadian Football League. And a Saturday afternoon game for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers against the Toronto Argonauts. And we will be all over that today on the program. John Hodge of Three Down Nation is going to join us coming up in a few minutes. And then we'll speak with former CFLer and the new Argos analyst along with our pal Mike Hogan, Nate Aje, who will join us. And we'll get a little bit more on the double blue going into tomorrow's game uh, at BMO Field in Toronto in the Argos home opener. Um, NFL continues... Uh, Week two of the preseason got underway last night. Patriots absolutely walking over the Philadelphia Eagles. And, um, you know, we had that strange situation with Mike Riley last week, even stranger last night. Jalen Hurts in the hospital for abdominal pains. Um, he seemed to be ready to go for the game just 20 minutes beforehand. So that certainly is a story to watch. But we'll go around Lee Hacksaw Hamilton's NFL notebook with the big stories of training camp coming up a little later on. And at the end of the program, it's Friday afternoon. We always like to have a little fun to finish off the weekend or the week heading into the weekend. And our friends at Canadian Club have another I Love Rye package. It's Canadian Club, official sponsor of the Bombers. Uh, we've got some of the good stuff, the CC for you, uh, some glassware, and even, oh, I should have brought these with me to uh, to the studio, um, some really cool bomber socks uh, along with it. So we'll have a package that we'll put together. Leighton was our winner last week. Leighton, good news. I got the stuff for you. We can arrange in the next day or so to get that to you. And we will have another winner at the end of the program. So if you're with us on YouTube, make sure you stick around and stay until the end of the program. Great to see everyone uh, here already. There's Dallas. Good luck tomorrow, pal. Getting married on the weekend. Uh, we've also got Frosty in here. Wrench Doozer's there. Wayne Jones. Uh, and Wayne is asking if I'm wearing velvet. I I would wear velvet if I had. I, I've often said I'd like to, you know, the pandemic has taught me how dress clothes are such an annoyance. Not that I was wearing many of them, but as someone that had to wear a suit for a decade, um, the ability to not put on collared shirts and even jeans has been wonderful. And I have thought about potentially transitioning to like well, one of those mafioso types that wear custom made velvet or velour jumpsuits. Um, maybe I'll ask that for my birthday or for Christmas coming up yet. I do not have it. This is uh, just a DraftKings hoodie, but it is very comfortable. And it must look that way on the screen. Um, lots of talk about the Bomber game. And of course, lots of talk about the Coyotes. We'll get to that in just a minute. As I mentioned, we'll have a Canadian Club giveaway at the end of the program today. Uh, we welcome Canadian Club, Royal Sports, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Paramount Services Limited, Not Auto Corp, Boston Pizza, Little Brown Jug, Assiniboia Downs, Breezy Bend Country Club, and Cool Bet Canada. Our wonderful sponsors that help us make this show happen each and every day. Let's get Michael Remus in here and uh, remote. The weekend's here, and it is finally raining outside. Um, but we uh, have got a lot of great football to watch this week, and including a bomber game tomorrow. And uh, how about the Elks getting off the mat last night with a big win at BC Place? I got to say, I had a good laugh at um, opening the can to start the show on Friday. <laughs> I remember you, you used to open cans in our old studio. And like you kind of have to hide it, but you could hear. Now it's like, fuck it. We'll just open it right into the microphone. F funniest thing is, I literally did exactly what I just did. Opening the can into the microphone. 
<laughs> on the yeah. first the first ever edition of Hustler and Lawless on yeah. CJOB. Yeah. And the show was at 10:30 in the morning. Uh but <laughs> so it was sort of funny especially doing it on OB. Uh those were yeah. fun times, but yes, I do still like opening cans into the microphone. Uh, because it is time to get going here on uh, on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk. Now, yeah, uh, we will talk about this Coyote situation in a minute. Uh, but first off, what did you think of that game yeah. last night? I, I was really impressed with the Elks. I mm-hmm. thought BC stepped up big time in the second half. Uh, but maybe the most impressive thing that could be a big part of turning the Elks season around was the way they were able to run the ball in the final three minutes, moving the chains. And ne- they didn't have to score. They never even gave the ball back to BC and ended up in the victory formation on the final play of the game. Yeah, it's like they finally realized Greg Ellingson was on the team and they can throw him the ball. And if you saw his price on DraftKings at like some ridiculous 5400 and you're like, this is too low for this guy, I have to play him like I did and, and a couple other people, uh, you were awarded. He did have like 150 yards. James Wilder Jr., I mean, his receiving threat. Uh, he was like moving the pile, some ridiculous lengthy runs to move the chains at the end of the game to seal it and ruining the BC Lions homecoming and ruining the open, you know, the first game of their new owner who was, you know, featured on the broadcast as well. Looks like a you know packed house to the capacity that they're allowed to have there in BC. But Elks, we were worried about them and the offense had been able to, you know, get first downs and move the ball, but they couldn't score touchdowns. They scored just enough yesterday. While uh, held Mike Riley, who, you know, God took a couple of big hits and maybe he was more banged up toward the end of the game. But um, he started off, you know, feeling uh, pretty healthy. So, you know, the I think it's been murky there in the West. now. I think it's Bombers, then the Riders, and then figure out BC, Edmonton. And we'll see how Calgary looks. Is that tonight with the new tonight with the new quarterback? That is tonight. I believe an eight thirty mm-hmm. start here in Winnipeg. You'll see that game on TSN, and of course, our buddy Dustin Nielsen had the call last night in Vancouver and is in uh, the air right now, heading to Toronto. And he'll, I, I think he told us this week he's calling the next five Blue Bomber games. So um, uh, that's awesome for us. We love Dusty, and great to have him join us on the show occasionally. And he'll be uh, well versed in all things blue and gold over the course of this next month with him doing so many of these games. Um, the new uh, Lions owner, Amar Doman, um, I, I, I'm first of all really happy for the team, for the Canadian Football League, um, to have a new owner uh, in BC. Uh, it seems like he's in very successful part of the South Asian community, which I think could be very big in expanding the reach of the Canadian Football League there, and a guy that really does care. But I got to tell you, Reem, I think he got a crash course into the ups and downs of being a professional, an owner in professional sports. I know he got a lot of love before the game and there was a lot of excitement about him taking over the team. I don't know if you caught that. I believe it was in the second quarter. He sat down with Dusty and Suits in, yes. the, uh, in the booth to do an interview as the Eskim- or the Elks began a drive on their own two-yard line and proceeded to go 108 yards for a touchdown over the course of the interview. Welcome yeah. welcome to the league, buddy. They were interviewing him, and it's like Greg Ellingson catches a 54-yard <laughs> pass. Like, there's absolutely no commentary being <laughs> being done. Everyone's <laughs> just silent. It's pretty tough. And I like seeing uh, Dustin Nielsen in the booth, but I have a good laugh every time they show him because I didn't realize how um, tall of an individual he is. And next to Glenn Suter, I think I did I say this on here before. Have I just said it to you privately that uh, privately, but it, it deserves yeah, repeating that like you'd think that Dustin Nielsen with his size is the former pro football player, and Glenn Suter is the you know, play-by-play guy. But no, that is not the case. <laughs> but it is an incredible size difference between Dusty and uh, Glenn Suter when watching. Dusty now, has like eight inches on Suter. I get such a kick. Out of uh, whenever they show them in the booth, I just start laughing because he looks enormous. And Suter's like the small guy who played uh, what he played safety, defensive back. So he's just, but uh, you know, pro football player nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, anyways, that's a great team. Uh, Dusty will be back on the mic for the Bombers and Argos, and we'll talk plenty about that game coming up. As I mentioned, Atage, who is uh, the Argos analyst, a little bit later on. And now we'll also get thoughts on last night's game and tomorrow's tilt between the Argos and Bombers with John Hodge of Three Down Nation. So I tweeted this out earlier, Remus. Longtime listeners know I vowed long ago that I was done talking about the Arizona Coyotes off ice situations. I don't care who their owner is. I don't care what their attendance is. 
I like once the Jets came back and got a team and we were in the National Hockey League and we had our own team to worry about, I completely washed my hands of the Coyotes. But in this city, 10 years later, after we got an NHL team back, I don't think there is anything that is more clickbait in the city of Winnipeg than anything to do with the Coyotes having problems when it comes to their arena, the city of Glendale, and on and on and on. And lo and behold, yesterday, shortly after we ended the program, my timeline was flooded with a few legitimate hockey people, but far more people that I know in Winnipeg cracking on the Coyotes because the city of Glendale has canceled the lease after this season. And by all accounts, the uh, National Hockey League in Arizona. I still think it's highly likely that they'll be playing somewhere in Arizona next year, but start up the rumor mill, start up the conversations because you'll hear the Quebec City people saying things and a lot of Canadian people that for whatever reason romanticize about the National Hockey League in Quebec City like that. They bring that up. Uh, you've got Houston. You've got Kansas City. You've got some other locales that I think would love to get a team. And then a lot of questions as to whether they can build an arena in Tempe, which they talked about. Obviously, they wouldn't be able to be arranged for next season. Um, so the Coyotes have another big mess on their hands, and um, that almost feels like business as usual for that team that has been, you know, in one mess or another for basically their entire existence since 1996 and leaving Winnipeg. Yeah, I'll never forget how, what was it, like 2011, when it seemed like the Coyotes were very close to returning to Winnipeg, and then it was uh, Atlanta that ended up coming here, but... It seems like since it, I was reading Craig Morgan's, it's Craig S. Morgan on Twitter, he's been following this for a long time, his on his sub stack. And it says 2009, you know, they've switched owners, um, they've had arenas, and what basically happened here was, I think the city of Glendale got sick of going year to year um, with the Coyotes on their lease. So, you know, they've been going year to year, and they want this arena is from 2004, it needs some upgrades. And they want the Coyotes to pay for part of them. And to do that, they would want the Coyotes to commit to a long-term lease so they can, you know, share the arena. But Coyotes and the NHL have been saying for a long time, you know what, this isn't going to work in Glendale. All the fans are in Scottsdale. We need an arena that's actually close because if you're in, why would you want to drive an hour to see a game? So, and also, you know, it, it prevents them from having other events. So it seems like Glendale's like, you know what, if we have 20 events that hold at least 10,000 people a year, Instead of having 43, you know, 41 home games plus two preseason games, holding how many, like 5,000? How many did they get? Eight, <laughs> 10? The math, the math is ugly when, yeah. you, when you work it yeah. out. <laughs> well, that's what they're saying. So maybe they can have some concerts, you know, conventions, um, anything there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it makes it kind of interesting. Like, where are the Coyotes going to go? They say they want to stay in Arizona. And it amazes me how much the NHL has tried to keep this team in Arizona when Atlanta was like, oh, see ya. But it was overnight. They came here, <laughs> and it seems like there are other places, um, you know, that are would be viable, but they are determined to get the what the snowbirds in Arizona. So I mean, we'll see what happens. The one thing that's interesting, if they do build a, no, a new arena, it kind of screws over the Gila River Arena because that in uh, Glendale, because then they'll be like third on the pecking order ahead of what the other, you know, the new arena and uh, what the arena where the uh, Suns play. I'm not as familiar with Phoenix, but this is from what I've what I yeah. read before the show. So. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Maybe it's a negotiating tactic, but I think the NHL is done, has been saying forever they're done with Glendale, and Glendale says, you know what, we can't put up with your BS anymore. You, We're actually done with you now, and uh, we'll see how it works <laughs> out for both sides. Uh, I know a lot of people will talk about Quebec City. I'll I'll be honest. I've never been a big guy on the Quebec City train, and this goes back to when we were losing our team the first time. I mean, we're putting 15,000, 20,000 people into the forks and kids are emptying out the piggy banks to save the Jets. And they had like 500 people out in Quebec City. I mean, it almost felt like they were just owed the team. Um, and I, I mean, and regardless, that's just my own opinion. And I would love to see the team go to Kansas City. I mean, they have a beautiful downtown arena ready to go um, that was essentially built for either an NBA team or an NHL team. And selfishly, and I think for fans that like to do road trips, the opportunity to get on the Pemina Highway with your buddies, drive 12 hours and see NHL hockey and the Chiefs at Arrowhead on a weekend, sign me up for that. 
Um, but honestly, I do think that Kansas City or Houston, from the National Hockey League's perspective, it would be a logical choice, um, first and foremost, because it's so perfect within the divisions. Houston is a huge market. I mean, one of the biggest markets in the United States. Um, I think if they could get into Houston, uh, that would be would be great for the National Hockey League. And Kansas City is an unbelievable sports town. They cover and support you know, the soccer team, certainly the Royals who, you know, win a World Series every 30 years and then are garbage for all of the time in between that. Uh, and the Chiefs, who are now one of the best teams in the world, but for a long time weren't very, very well supported. And again, they do have a facility. So those are a couple of the places that, uh, that I've seen. But I did see some uh, odds today on where the Coyotes, Coyotes will be playing next year. And Arizona as a state is still... The heavy favorite at minus 400, Reem, and, and that shouldn't be a surprise because Gary Bettman, you know, today, as we've heard from Craig's reporting, you know, feels that this is a negotiating ploy, and it may very well be, uh, but it's another thing that gets into the public, and I do, I will say this, I do really feel for the Coyotes fans, anyone that's been there to a game knows that the the, the number of them is not high. Uh, and it is a real pain in the ass to get to that arena if you don't live in and around Glendale, and most people don't. But they do have a pretty hardcore group of supporters that have been with them for a long time, and those people have deserved better. And uh, and to be honest, a lot of the players in the team, I think, have deserved better with some of the decisions that have been made. Uh, but anyways, here we are, 2021. Stop me if you've heard this one before. The Coyotes are having arena issues and may have to find a new home for next year. Well, for right now, they will have to find a new home, whether it's in the same market or elsewhere, is going to be a big story going forward. And um, for some reason, that still gets a lot. Of, that is the true clickbait of Winnipeg sports. Anything to do, Remus, with the Coyotes and their ownership slash arena issues. Yeah, everyone's fired uh, fired up about that. Where are they going to play? I think um, Arizona, sorry, Arizona. Uh, Houston would be logical choice. I mean, they've supported AHL hockey. I mean, want to go back to the WHA. There's a hockey history, big, huge market in Houston, and I don't think they have their AHL team anymore. I think it just moved um, somewhere. And then Kansas City, they've had that new arena, Sprint Center, for a while. Um, you know, lines up both cities line up in the Central Division, have natural rivalries either with Dallas or with you know St. Louis, Chicago, in case of Kansas City. You know, everyone's saying Quebec City. I don't see that. You know, they've already got the divisions nice and even. I don't see them going to Quebec City. And I do kind of feel bad for Quebec City. Yes, they built this nice new arena to attract the NHL. You get passed over um, from, you know, the Jets get Atlanta. Winnipeg gets Atlanta. You get passed over twice in expansion to Vegas and Seattle. And here you are with this brand new nice arena that is hosting, what, junior hockey? in hopes of bringing back the Nordique. So I don't know if there is even a path for Quebec City to get a team. I guess if Florida, if they decide Florida isn't working and you move you move the Panthers or Carolina at some point, but I don't I don't know if that's going down ever. Well, here so. here's here's the other thing that is um very problematic for Quebec City. In 2011, the Canadian dollar was very strong. I think it was close to even. Uh, it's certainly not there right now. And the cost for the Jets to acquire the Thrashers was $170 million. Um, they ju- what, what, was the, yeah. what was the price tag for, for the Kraken? Like I mean, 600, was, 600 yeah, million? Like 600 plus million. their $1 plus arena? <laughs> so, um, yeah. anyways, I'm really not too sure how that works. The bottom line is, and here's the thing that I actually do care about, if they move... Say they went to Kansas City or Houston, and they become they're the Kansas City Coyotes. Uh, at that point, do we not right the wrong and give the Jets their history back up until 1996, and then the Coyotes' history can be the Arizona slash Kansas City history? Don't it get makes me started. Too much sense, and it's long overdue. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me started. And uh, I've said this forever: bring back the Jets 1.0 records to. 2.0 Jets, like make it Winnipeg NHL. It makes too much sense. Other leagues have done it. Um, I've wrote about this on my personal website before. Uh, it's insane when it's, it's it's the most ridiculous thing ever. It's too confusing. You have the Jets honoring the Jets heritage while they don't own the records. And I know people oppose, well, it's the franchise history. And I'm like, look, uh, 
AHL does that. Other leagues have moved history zone. It's not a tangible thing. You can say um, in Winnipeg NHL history. So I don't know why they're not doing that. It seems to make <laughs> make too much uh, make too much sense. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. And I guess there is a valid argument as to what happens to the Thrasher's history. It's defunct. Um, it, well, it is defunct, but I mean, those those seasons still happen. Maybe they're just Atlanta Thrasher's records. Exactly. Have it. What Anyways, happened to the I, Golden I, Seals? I, what happened to them, Hus? Go look, the, go look up what happened to the Golden Seals, because uh, it's the same thing. So what, what did happen? I don't know. They became like the the Rocky. Did they just de- did they just go defunct or did they become another team? I I forget. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll do some more digging. I got this. it. Anyways, I, d- I, I looked into agree. this. We would love to have those. We would love. I to looked have into those this back. year years ago, and there's no more more frustrating thing. It's like, well, Ilya Kovalchuk is the Jets record holder for rookie goals in a season, and you lo- you know watch. Coyotes games and they bring up past records and it's like yeah. oh uh, Solani seventy six goals when we're talking about rookie goal leaders yeah that it's, triggers it's a confu- lot of people especially it's con- you it's also confusing <laughs> when you have the Arizona history in Winnipeg and like the Winnipeg history being it's too confusing it's confusing <laughs> nobody likes it uh, all right hit uh, us up in the chat with your thoughts sorry. on all of those all of those topics I you know that's just what happens when we have this conversation each and every time and uh, unfortunately we had to bring it up I vowed that we would not be talking about coyotes moving and stuff ever again and yet here we are uh, the thing that really did get me going was Kent Swanson is a chief's reporter tweeting out a picture of a coyotes jersey with Mahomes on it and Mahomes of course owns part of the Royals and the soccer team and Ah, why not get a hockey team as well? All right, we're going to get ready for Bombers Argos coming up with John Hodge, Natasha, a little bit later on. Uh, but do want to thank Canadian Club, official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, for joining us on board here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. I can tell you, I hooked up with James yesterday from CC, and we have some uh, great prizes to give away coming up. We've got the I Love Rye package that Leighton won last Friday. We'll do another one at the end of the program. So make sure if you're with us in the YouTube chat to stick around until the end of the program. And uh, you can uh, maybe make your weekend a little bit better with the great taste of CC over ice, a little ginger ale, maybe a little Pepsi, whatever your flavor is. CC, uh, along with all the other great products they have as part of the Beam Suntory team. So end of the show. You could be a winner finishing off the week with Canadian Club. Of course, Royal Sports, I will tease this officially on Monday. We will make the announcement. I showed you the koozie that we've got in the store. Well, we have a long-awaited edition that is finally ready for launch. uh, And no one better to do it with than our first ever sponsor. Way back to the pre-radio days, our friends at Royal Sports. This is the best store in the city. 650 Rally in AK, 750 Pemina Highway. They are ready for hockey season. Although the one thing that they actually do need is uh, a few more people to uh, help them in the store. If you have a hockey player in the family uh, or someone that is just very sports minded that is looking for um, you know a job, they would love to hear from you. Uh, you can check out their Instagram page right there that Remus has up at Royal Sports Pemina. But they are hiring right now, and um, you know considering the amount they work with hockey players, they love to have hockey players helping out other hockey players. So people, especially in the hockey industry, if you're looking for a great spot, uh, awesome place to work. Um, for the Hasbeek. So uh, hit them up, check out their Instagram and uh, you can apply, pop by there this weekend. And as I said, a very exciting announcement after the weekend on a new item from Winnipeg Sports Talk and Royal Sports. And of course, the Nick and Nicky DQ group, I I will tell you, Schickster, Schickster, I see that comment. (laughs) Don't go there. Um, We, um, it's raining outside, so it might not be the best blizzard day of the year, but I'll tell you what. You know what would go great with the game tomorrow afternoon? How about a bomber-themed ice cream cake from Nick and Nicky DQ? And while you're at it, you can grab an Ultimate Grill Burger while you're picking it up. Hit them up on Instagram, at DQ Manitoba. They'll make it in advance for you. You can pop by and pick them up. And whenever you're thinking the great taste of DQ, support our friends Nick and DQ. who have been such great supporters of ours. DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, the DQ at Polo Park, and of course, the Dairy Queen at St. Anne's. Again, hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. All right, let's get ready for some football. We had a great game last night. We got another one tonight. And then tomorrow, it's the Bombers and the Toronto Argonauts. And uh, let's get ready for the game right now with our good friend, John Hodge of Three Down Nation. John, what's going on? How are you? Living the dream, buddy. And hey, I don't care if it's cold. I still want a blizzard. (laughs) 
<laughs> Absolutely. Hey, uh, give us a quick weather update. I know you're outside for folks that are listening on the podcast. John, kind enough to you know, pull over and join us through the wonders of technology. We're finally getting some of this rain that everyone's been begging for for a month. Yeah, I know uh, I know people across the province, Western Manitoba and Winnipeg, South Manitoba, everybody's in a, a different state of drought. Um, I know, uh, for instance, you know, like my my brother and his wife are are in Morden and they they can't do anything. It seems like their their water reduction is crazy. Um, so fortunately, we're getting some much needed rain. Uh, I think we're expected to get somewhere like, thir- you know, 30 millimeters, which is not you know, the, it's not enough for the farmers, but it's it's a lot better than nothing. So it's good news. Amen to that. And of course, tomorrow, the one Saturday that we've actually got a football game in the <laughs> afternoon that'll probably people will keep people inside or at the bar with their friends to watch the game. So uh, maybe the timing isn't that bad. Hey, before we get into the Bombers and Argos, uh, what'd you think of the game last night? Edmonton avoiding an 0-3 start. Um, I, I, you know, I thought BC came back and really pushed in the second half. But man, was I impressed with that four-minute offense that uh, sealed the game for the Eskimos and uh, the running of James Wilder and moving the chains in that situation late in the fourth. Yeah, to me, it, it was a tale of of really one injury, and that's to Joel Figueroa, the left tackle for the BC Lions. Joel is is one of the best, uh, you know, blindside blockers in the CFL, and the Lions looked great early. Michael Riley had time in the pocket, and all of a sudden. David Neville comes in. He's a former third round pick out of Nebraska. Basically was a was a PR guy in 2019, played a little at the end of the season. Well, he comes in and literally Riley's first drop back, he gets annihilated, right? By by the rookie Costigan coming off the edge. So after that happened, and all of a sudden the Elks could kind of tee things up a little bit. I think the Lions had to shift things on offense. You know, that was that was game. Uh that was that was that was really the turning point. But that said, Good for the Elks getting, especially Greg Ellingson going. He had one catch in week two, which was embarrassing. I mean, if you've got a if you've got a weapon like Greg Ellingson in your offense and you can get him one catch for one yard, I it defies logic. So the fact that he was able to catch nine passes yesterday out almost 150 yards, uh, you, you get him going, good things are gonna happen. And the Elks got their first win. So all in all, a good night. First game for the for the new owner of the BC Lions, desperately needed, obviously. Uh, to have local, uh, you know, really well-qualified, deep-pocketed ownership there. Uh, so, yeah, good night, and uh, I'm excited for what the rest of the week has to hold. Hey, uh, just before we get to tomorrow's game, um, what do you think about tonight? I mean, Calgary already 0-2 <laughs> and without Bo Levi Mitchell. I mean, this is not a situation that almost seemed conceivable that the Stamps could be in, and uh, yet here we are, John. Yeah, I don't know when the last time the Stamps were were four and a half point underdogs at home was, but I, I think I might have been in diapers. Um, they are so good at home. Um, they they I think looking back the last ten seasons, I don't think they've finished worse than six and three at home. A lot of seasons they go seven and two, eight and one. They've had a couple of undefeated seasons even. So so looking at it now, they're already zero and two. We're in a shortened season. So if they go zero and three to start the year, they'd have to win out at home. Um, including some really tough games. They host one. They, they got five games down the stretch. So I was looking at their schedule yesterday. Five of their last, uh, it would be 11 games, are against Winnipeg and Saskatchewan. And anybody paying close attention to the CFL oh. on the prairies these days knows that Winnipeg and Saskatchewan are, are honestly head and shoulders above everybody else right now. Montreal looked really good in week two. We have to see what they do Friday night against the Stamps, obviously. But... You know, if if you're a Stamps fan, I think you're you're pretty darn close to pushing the panic button. The big surprise was the Stamps this week saying that Jake Meyer is going to be starting for them at quarterback. And if you're sitting there going, wait, who the heck is Jake Meyer? The answer is exactly. He's a raw rookie. They had Michael O'Connor uh, listed as the backup week one, week two, the Canadian at UBC. He's not starting. And they had Dakota Prukop in training camp who looked actually really good down the stretch with Toronto. Uh, in 2019, but they cut him as well coming out of camp. So it it's it's a big surprise. Jake Meyer, looking at him, and I, I spoke with him in a media availability a few weeks ago. I think they like how brash he is. I think they like uh, the fact that he's a little bit like Bo Levi Mitchell in that sense. I don't think he's a he's a super you know strong dual threat pivot, but he can move. Um, but he'll have no problem commanding the huddle. The question is, of course, how's he going to fare in his first pro start? Because obviously you can't get any more green 
than he is. He's been in the CFL for a grand total of about nine weeks, and he's never thrown a pass. So I think the the, the stamps are are ripe for the picking at home, as long as the Alouettes can can keep rolling with what they did in week two, dominating Edmonton at Commonwealth. Well, I just quickly on that, I mean, I have to say, and I realized it was week two and we didn't get to see them in week one, but as far as the first look of a team that we hadn't seen play in a year and a half, I couldn't have been more impressed with the Montreal Alouettes and the job that they did on the Elks. I think many of us thought, oh, we'll give them a mulligan for what happened in week one against Ottawa. They got their asses kicked by Montreal. Absolutely, they did. That That Montreal team in 2019 was good. I mean, Vernon Adams, people forget he wasn't the starter week one. It was Antonio Pipkin. Pipkin got hurt. Adams came in and won the job. Kahari um, was barely the coach week one. <laughs> yeah, Kahari Jones had been the coach for about four days, I think, when the regular season got, got started after Mike Sherman uh, got let go. So that team came out of nowhere. But you look at it, they got Quan Bray back. They got William Stan back back. Eugene Lewis, I think, might be the most underrated receiver in the CFL. B.J. Cunningham also somehow flies under the radar. He's been putting up. You know, 800, 900,000 yard seasons for about six years at this point. People never talk about BJ Cunningham. They've got Jake Weineke, who made certainly the catch of the year thus far 42 yards for a touchdown against Edmonton. And on defense, like the, the defense, I think, especially the front four, was, was holding that team back a little bit in 2019. John Bowman was coming off the edge at age 36. He's now retired, but you go out, they, they get Nick Usher. They get Almondo Sewell, who's been talking smack about Trevor Harris the last two weeks, which I love. Uh, and Antonio Simmons had two sacks in week two. So if that that offense is, I mean, it's picked up exactly where it left off in 19. Well, if that defense is getting after the quarterback, look out. The Alouettes, you know, I, I had them I had them in third place in the East to start the season while the Thai Cats have fallen flat. The Argos, uh, I think, will be one and two after tomorrow's game against Winnipeg. All of a sudden, in a, especially in a shortened season, Alouettes winning the East, very much on the table. Uh, no doubt about it. All right, John Hodge of Three Down Nations with us. Uh, the game we'll all be paying attention to the most is tomorrow afternoon, 3 p.m. on TSN. It's the Bombers and Argos, a rematch of last week's game here in Winnipeg at IG Field, won by the Bombers. The story of the Bombers so far this season is twofold. You have to start with the defense. They've given up 13 points in two games, John. <laughs> Um, and then I guess the other side of it is just how good and comfortable Zach Caleros looks after a full training camp. Where do you want to start with Winnipeg going into this one? Let's start with the defense because I don't think they've got enough credit for, for what they've done. They've And let's also forget, people are talking about Andrew Harris's injury, Darvin Adams. The defensive side of the ball has, has had injuries as well. Mercy Madison was lost to an Achilles tear in training camp. So Josh Johnson slots in. Well, he gets hurt about, I think it was five or ten minutes into the season opener. And they had to bring Brandon Alexander down. Then he goes back. Mike Jones comes to the to the strong side linebacker position. Kyrie Wilson hasn't played on the other side. They started John Trell Rockamore there week one. Jesse Briggs week two. So so they've been not horribly, but but somewhat banged up with with some fresh talent, some rookies starting. Two rookies on the boundary side of the secondary have been spectacular. DeAndre Alford and Dietrich Nichols last week held DeVaris Daniels and Eric Rogers to six catches which is sensational to me. That is probably outside of Darrell Walker and Greg Ellingson and Edmondson, the top one, two receiving combo in the CFL and Daniels and Rogers looked very average, very mediocre against Winnipeg in week two. So credit to Richie Hall, the rest of the defensive staff. I, I suspected they might miss Glenn Young there. Uh, he was of course the, the front seven coach in, in Winnipeg in 2019 uh, on route to their Grey Cup win. He's now the DC in Toronto, so they'll see some of him on Saturday. But, uh, man, the the talent has has certainly continued to get after the quarterback, Jackson, Jeffcoat, Willie Jefferson, both of whom, you know, are also playing through little nicks here and there. They, they're, they're always on the injured injury report that the team is putting out. Willie Jefferson was questionable for week two, didn't show any signs of rust, wear and tear, whatever. Um, so yeah, definitely the defense has, has, has been great. And Zach Kolaris. Yeah. I mean, he, he's turned back the clock, which at this point of his career, frankly, I was skeptical that he'd be able to do. He's 33, but he's running like he was when he was 25, 26, 27 as a, a young buck with the Toronto Argos. And then a potential MOP candidate as the starter for the Hamilton Tiger Cats back in 14, 15, 16. So 
Um, you know, he's, he's not running down the field a whole heck of a lot, but the Bombers don't need him to do that. What they need him to do is buy time in the pocket when that stellar offensive line uh, has a lapse or, or, or maybe when the opponents just completely overwhelm the front with pressure. Well, if Kolaris can, conti- can, can continue to do that, this team is going to be really dangerous because we know they can run the football. We know the offensive line is elite. We know the receiving core can do enough to win you games. Well, if Kolaris can buy time on top of that, they're going to be a really, really tough out for opposing teams this season. Uh, John, the Bombers released their depth chart this morning as they got onto the plane, and uh, we'll focus on the offense first up. Uh, the good news, Darvin Adams is back. Moving back to his normal spot at slot back, he started at boundary wide receiver week one and week two in the absence of, of Darvin Adams. I don't think that anybody in the receiving core, uh, potentially with the uh, with the exception of McKnight, the rookie who, who, who made his first start last week, has the versatility that Nick Dembski has. He does a lot of you know, kind of the Andrew Harris type things out of the backfield. You know, he, he, he moves in motion. He stands into block. He'll leak out as, as a screen option or a short option misdirection. Um, so I think they will miss that element of the offense a little bit. Uh, Andrew Harris was back practicing in a limited uh, capacity this week. So I thought maybe, you know, if, if Harris is coming in, you, you don't miss Dembski all that much. Well, he's so out. Brady Oliveira gets the start. Um Personally, if I was the Bombers, I'd be looking at Johnny Augustine, the backup running back, to maybe do some of those Nick Dembski type things, uh, receive ca- uh, catches out of the backfield, stand in the block, etc. Uh, I asked Augustine before the season started, you know, what have you worked on? And he said the receiving game is a big part of what he's spent the extended offseason doing. So that's what I would look to do in the absence of Nick Dembski is, is if Kenny Lawler, for instance, isn't going to do those things or the rookie McKnight isn't going to do those things, then maybe Augustine is a potential option because the Bombers haven't used him week one or week two with Brady Oliveira slinging the rock. It's time to get Augustine some touches in the offense. Well, and, and certainly it'll be time to get Darvin Adams some touches. Um, you know, yes. to me, and we talked a lot in the first couple of weeks about, you know, who do the Bombers need back more? And it's crazy thought. I mean, Andrew Harris has been so important to this football team. But when you saw the way Brady Oliveira was able to run in week number one behind that Bomber offensive line, you realize that they had a pretty good backup behind him. Darvin Adams is a pretty unique player and really the deep threat for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And, you know, to me, it certainly changes Zach Caleros' comfort level going deep as well as a guy that, you know, he's had a lot of success with before on the outside. Yeah, and also worth noting, Robertson Daniel, the boundary corner for the Argos, got hurt after week one. They started a rookie there, uh, Jamal Peters. And uh, so I hit some overs on Kenny Lawler at boundary wide in week two. If anybody uh, feels interested in placing a bet, personally, I'd be looking to bet the overs on Darvin Adams in week three. Uh, The Argos have a really good secondary across the board. So you find the rookie bet against him. Uh, I think Jamal Peters is perfectly, you know, he's a perfectly fine player, but if I'm Adams, I'm hungry. If I'm Buck Pierce, I want to use him. And uh, again, going against a really good Toronto defense, I think that's one of the areas they could look to exploit. So I would not be surprised at all, Hustler, if Darvin Adams had a big game, because uh, we all know, I mean, and, and any time any football player gets the chance to work off a rookie, especially a wide receiver, whoo. They're, they're licking their chops, so I wouldn't be surprised if Adams yeah, was doing that right now. Uh, and Darvin's already pissed that he missed the first couple of games, so I'm sure he'll want to make an impact and make an impact early. Um, John, on the other side of the football, um, newcomer Kevin Brown is active this week. I mean, maybe for folks that aren't familiar with him, give us a little bit of 411 on the newest bomber uh, and what he brings to the table and why the coaching staff would be comfortable enough for a guy that's been here on such a short period of time to suit up in uh, in a game just days after coming to Winnipeg. Yeah, Brown started a number of games for the Red Blacks in 18 and 19 at, at weak side linebacker. Uh, wasn't retained in free agency, but was one of the, the many uh, former Red Blacks who uh, former Ottawa assistant general manager, now general manager of the Edmonton Elks, Brock Sunderland, brought to the green and gold. He was a surprise camp cut. They basically cut all their veteran linebackers. They also released Vontae Diggs, 
uh, in Edmonton, going basically with an all rookie crew there um, for the Elks. And, uh, you know, he, he's a linebacker with CFL experience, and that's not something that that the Bombers have a ton of right now. Uh, Kyrie Wilson's on the injured list. John Trell Rockamore, who started week one, is on the injured list as well. So he brings some nice depth. Uh, Naka Sonyeka, veteran Canadian uh, linebacker who's who's on PR to start the season, is also making his regular season Blue Bomber debut. So I wouldn't be surprised if these guys got mixed and matched into the linebacking core a little bit. If they want to get Brown a lot of time on defense, they're going to have to switch the ratio a little bit because he would be coming on in place likely of Jesse Briggs, the Canadian. Um, but certainly you can't have too many of those linebacker body types in the CFL where special teams are everything. And that's where a lot of depth linebackers make their money, right? On on the teams, on cover teams, punt, return, or punt cover, kickoff cover, that kind of thing. And the Bombers for the last four years under Mike O'Shea, especially as a special teams oriented head coach, have have been great traditionally returning the football covering kicks that kind of thing so i think that's what what kevin brown brings and who knows as uh as he continues to get to get kind of amalgamated in the in the defense if the bombers can do it from a ratio perspective maybe he he ends up starting at weak side linebacker maybe there was a chance he would have done it but the bombers are starting an extra american this week on offense with nick with nick Dembski out so definitely a potential starter in weeks to come you just have to find a canadian to slot in elsewhere to make it happen john i, I think as we uh poke around every aspect of the winnipeg football club throughout the season this will be a weekly topic but let me take your temperature on where you're at with the bomber special teams right now well i mean janarian grant it was a limited sample size in 2019, but I talked to people in the league who called him the best returner they'd seen in the CFL. Like the level of love that Janarian Grant got was like, took me aback. I remember I asked uh, uh, Rob Maver who punted against uh, Janarian Grant many times about him. And he said, Janarian Grant is one of those players who makes me happy. I'm retired. Like that was the quote. He's like, it gives me nightmares. <laughs> The idea of punting against Janarian Grant. He's such a difference maker. So he's still out. But Charles Nelson looked good in week two uh, doing that. The kicking side is still a little, a little bit of a mystery. Mike O'Shea opted not to, to kick long field goals in week one with Tyler Capena in his first game with the team. We didn't see any long field goals in week two as well. And in fairness to Mark Leggio, his gross punting numbers aren't great, but his net punting yards are are and any any punter you talk to will tell you that net is what matters it doesn't matter if you boot at 80 yards if you're giving up a 50 yard return every time uh what you want to do is 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 force your opponents to start as far back in their own territory as possible and net punting i think he's he's 37 and a half yards right now he's doing a good job so as long as 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 legio is directionally punting well as long as the defense is is stymieing opposing opposing offenses forcing turnovers two and outs that kind of thing I wouldn't be concerned about the kicking game just yet. That said, at some point this season, we know the Bombers are going to need uh, a 45 or a 50-yard field goal to tie a game, to win a game, push it to overtime, something like that. And we're going to need uh, to see if Tyler Capena has has that kick in him. He's kicked 50-yarders in the CFL in the past before, and he's not a raw rookie. This is a guy who's been with four different teams before. The issue is he's never really won a job outright like he did in Winnipeg. Uh, in in training camp this year. So I'm really interested to see uh, when he gets the opportunity because it's not a matter of if the bombers aren't going to be aren't going to be punting short all season long. they're they're inevitably at some point going to try a long field goal because they'll have to. I'm interested to see does Tyler Capena have the leg to make that kick? Does he have the nerve to make that kick? Because if so, I mean, he's still a young kicker. He could be the guy in Winnipeg for the next 15 years and Mark Lego could be the punter for the next 15 years. But obviously, if you want that, you got to win the job. So I'm I'm interested to see how the kicking game will will unfold. Because honestly, he hasn't been tested yet. Everything Crepina has been asked to kick by Mike O'Shea thus far has been has been short. Uh, John Hodge of Three Down Nation with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, getting ready for the Bombers Argos. We're going to spend more time with Nanny Aj coming up, uh, focusing on the Argos. But from your perspective, how does Nick Arkbuckle's start change things for both the Argos offense and what the Bombers are going to have to handle on the defensive side of the football? Yeah, I think Arbuckle brings kind of that dimension with his leg, or with his legs that that McLeod Bethel Thompson doesn't. McLeod Bethel Thompson is, I mean, he's not totally immobile. He's not a pylon back there, but he's he's a little bit more of your prototypical pocket passer versus versus a guy like Nick Arbuckle, 
who who has always been mobile. And I know he's he's actually lost a fair amount of weight since the 2019 season when he was in Calgary. I think he's down something like 12 or 15 pounds. And uh, and he, he did that specifically to get faster, to get quicker. Um, so I think there's that dimension that he has, the ability to move around in the pocket better, uh, take off and run maybe a little bit more. Um, I was surprised, honestly, that he didn't look better in week two. Maybe it's just a testament to the bomber defense. But, you know, a lot of times when a quarterback comes on late, you know, you've had the whole game to kind of sit on the sidelines and watch and see what's going on and, you know, really pick things up that maybe are a little bit tougher to pick up if you're in the game. Well, he came on halfway through the third quarter in in, in week two and and looked look just as bad as McLeod Bethel Thompson did in the start. So I'm curious to see what we see. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little high on, on Nick Arbuckle. I really thought that he did some great things in Calgary, but at the same time, we have seen players in the past who are all-stars for Calgary go to free agency and underperform, right? Derek Dennis would be a classic example. He was, he was most outstanding offensive lineman in Calgary, goes to Saskatchewan, underperforms, goes back to Calgary. He's an all-star again. If I'm Nick Arbuckle, I want to prove I'm not one of those guys. I can be successful anywhere. And this is his, his first chance to start. So if you're the Bombers, there's a bit of a new dimension. But again, you know that week two, even with him coming off the bench, you shut him out. So I, I think if you're the Bombers, and, and you got a pick off of him too. So if I'm the Bombers, my, my confidence is high going up against Nick Arbuckle as the starter. How high do you think the confidence of the Riders are going up against the Red Blacks? Uh, do, they, do, are you, do you give them any shot of being in this game in the fourth quarter? I get the I, I give the Red Blacks a shot at winning this game the same way that I guess I could technically, technically beat Steph Curry in a three-point competition. You know, it's like that one in a million best day of your life. The Red Blacks just put out their depth chart. They're without their best offensive lineman this week in Nolan McMillan. Uh, he started to guard the first two games with them. He's played tackle as well in the past. So if if you're looking, and and they are coming off a bye as well. Teams generally play a little better off the bye. But um, no, I'm I'm not high at all on the Red Blacks this week. The Riders are 10.5 point favorites. I can't stand eating du- like double-digit spreads. I, I think I'm actually allergic to it. But I, I might be tempted this week just because the Red Blacks were completely unable to do anything on offense and on defense now, to make up for Nolan McMillan starting at uh, along the offensive line, they've replaced him with an American. They have Justin Howell, who is a safety, playing at field halfback. His job is to cover a receiver named Kyron Moore, who happens to be really, really, really good. Um, so I'm I'm very high on the Riders this week. I think they should be very confident. You can't take anything for granted. Obviously, we saw week one. Credit to Ottawa. They won the game, but I don't think they're going to be winning this one. I think they're going to fall to one and one. And I think uh, people like me who keep putting them at ninth place in the power rankings will be a little bit vindicated because I know that they have not been pleased that they uh, are continually ninth in the power rankings, despite being one and oh, and a number of other teams being being oh and two. Yeah, well, you're just completely ignoring that incredible <laughs> offensive performance that they put on for all of us in Edmonton in week one. I mean, uh, come on. One and oh, John, it, it's, it's about winning games, right? <laughs> Here, here's the thing, though. Like, power rankings are not standings. This is what I don't get. The reason we have power yeah. rankings <laughs> is because they're not standings. So don't sit there and tell me, well, we're one and oh. <laughs> yeah, we get that. But but a power ranking is, how good are these teams? And I know if I had a CFL team right now and someone said, hey, you can pick any of these opponents this week. Who do you want to play? I know which team I'm picking. That's the one I'm putting in ninth. It's Ottawa. And if they don't like it, then prove us wrong. Go out there and put up 500 yards and, and eight touchdowns. Do it. But but stop talking about it. Do it. Uh, John, this was awesome. And for folks that are listening on the podcast, this won't resonate with you. But when you first came on, I was mesmerized by your jacket. At first, I thought it was a bomber jacket. Then I thought, oh, maybe it's a Rams jacket. And then I noticed the Brazil flag. This is a Brazil yeah. jacket. Can we can we now refer to you as Hoginho on the show? <laughs> can we just ditch your full name and just go with the one name Brazilian term? Hoginho from Three Down Nation. <laughs> Sounds good to me, Hus. Hey, buddy, thanks for doing this. It's always great. What do you guys have coming up on the site over the course of the weekend? And of course, next week uh, after week three is completed. Well, we have several post-game reactions from from both sides of every game. We'll have, uh, we already got up on the site, Lions reactions from the game last night, Elks reactions from the game last night. Every Monday, we do our power rankings. Um, so you already know where Ottawa's going to be 
unless they perform well uh, this week. But uh, we got Power Rankings Tuesday. We got the ratings report. If you want to know how all the games did on television for the CFL, that's there. And Wednesdays, we got my weekly feature, Insider Talk, with anonymous quotes from people around the CFL, including executives, players, coaches, agents, uh, that kind of thing. So every day we, we're hammering out the content. I think we're on pace for 400 pieces of content for the month of August, which I think is the most we would have ever, ever done. So if there's anything you want to know about the CFL, check it out on 3 Now. We've, we've probably got an article about it. Uh, say hi to Dunk. You guys are doing an incredible job. Love having you on the program. Enjoy the games this weekend too, John. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your time. Appreciate it, Huss. Anytime. All the best. There he is. There's John Hodge of Three Down Nation. Hodginho today uh, wearing his Brazil jacket <laughs> here at Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, all right, we're going to continue Bombers Argos Talk. Just before we do that, uh, a big thank you and welcome to one of our newest sponsors, Paramount Services Limited. Uh, Paramount Services Limited, a full facility maintenance company serving commercial HVAC plumbing, electrical, and handyman services to all of your favorite convenience stores, restaurants, bars in Western Canada, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 28 years. Uh, if you or your business are looking for a one-stop shop for your kitchen supplies, cooler supplies, and so much more for your business or property anywhere in Western Canada, give them a call. Ask for my friend, Kerry O'Brien, or visit their website at paramountservicesltd.com for more information. And if you have some experience or know someone that does that's looking for a great gig, they're always looking for qualified techs who specialize in HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and handiwork, go to their website, paramountservicesltd.com, submit your resume today. They are a member of the local plumbers and pipe fitters union. Um, Got to give a shout out to our friends at Not Auto Corp. Been with us on Winnipeg Sports since day one. If you're looking for a new vehicle, before you do anything, why not check out what they've got at Not Auto Corp and get the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Not team. Uh, you can check out the new Teslas on the road. So many different sorts of vehicles they've got there. Really a great variety. And they'll help you find one if they don't have what you're looking for. They'll also service your car with the Red Seal technicians. They're detail it. And the finishing touches are going up on the car lab as well. Pop by and see them this weekend. Waverly and McGilvery or online at not.ca. And uh, well, the rain's coming this weekend. So why not set up shop with your friends at Boston Pizza tomorrow afternoon for the Bombers and Argos? You can check out the Burger Italiano, the Honey Dill Fried Chicken Sandwich as part of the Summer's Here menu. And even if you're not on the patio, you can certainly enjoy the White Sangria Smash, the Peachy Mojito Royale, the Galaxy Fish Bowl, or the Bulldog Margarita Fish Bowl, all part of the Summer's Here menu. Boston Pizza, bring your appetite. Sunglasses optional. All right, let's get back to some football talk. And this is a wonderful to welcome in. First time I've been able to refer to him is the Argos analyst, along with our pal Hoagie, his former CFL, Nade Aje, who will be on the call with Hoagie for tomorrow's Bombers Argos game in Toronto. Nate, what is up? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk. Thank you for having me. Excited to be on. My first time ever being on. Uh, very excited. Uh, I apologize for my background. I've got I'm moving today, and I got caught in some traffic. I didn't expect to be in the car, but my apologies uh, ahead of time. But well, uh, all in all, excited to be on with you. Hey, listen, it's great to have you on, and congratulations about the new gig. Always great. How did that all come to be? I mean, uh, you were thinking about playing this year. That didn't happen. And uh, the next thing you know, you're in the booth with Hoagie. Yeah, you know, well, I planned to play like 10 more years if I could. If they let me, I would have played 10 more years. But, you know, during the pandemic, was you know, home a lot with the family, started my own podcast, was getting into the media game. Had some opportunities outside of football that, you know, were, was pretty intriguing for me and, and was able to keep me home. So uh, while the pandemic happened, I mean, you had the year off, it was just going to be so much tougher to, to, to go back to football, especially I had established myself outside of the game. And uh, so I decided, you know, I still want to be a part of the game somehow. I still want to be, I still want to do my thing in the media world. Uh, so I hit up Hoagie. Uh, I have you know, good relationship with him. I talked to him all throughout the years. Well, especially while I was in Toronto, but a lot of respect for him. I think the world of him, and uh, he thought it, it was a great idea, but he was like, man, you still should be playing. Uh, I'm like, yeah, Hoagie, me too, I want to play, but, you know, family, we have three little uh, uh, kids now that, you know, need my full attention at home, and, you know, it just it would have killed me to play, and, um, you know, I just had to make that decision for the family, so that's why I'm in this role now. I still get to be part of the game. I don't take any hits but I get to enjoy the TFL action just like everybody else. 
Yeah, waking up in the morning after working is going to be a lot better than it was after game days. That much I can tell you. Um, let's talk about the Argos. I mean, your thoughts on uh, the team coming in uh, to the second of back-to-back -back games. What were the takeaways from the Toronto side of things from that loss in Winnipeg last week? Yeah, it was an interesting game because, you know, coming off that high of the, the Calgary victory, right, you thought, okay, this team is riding high. Um, Kyle Bethel Thompson is playing well. Is he going to take that next step into solidifying this in a starting spot? Because, you know, if you, you know, win two games like that, it would be hard to take him out that spot. You know, I thought they were going to come out offensively. It looked stale. Uh, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't similar to what I saw in Calgary. Uh, you know, a lot of – John White had a great game, which, you know, you love to see. Uh, there's a lot of missed opportunities, especially deep balls to Devaris Daniels that, you know, probably could have changed the complexion of that game. And, you know, it, it you know, it got one dimensional because, you know, you, you're losing the game. And against Winnipeg, you cannot be one dimensional. That, that was a big takeaway for me. So you, you know, that pass rush, that D line, you know them well. Like if you're, you know, behind in the game and they know they can smell blood in the water and then, then it's cancel Christmas after that. So, you know, for the, for this coming game, I look for a more balanced attack. Um, I'm looking forward to see what Arbogs could do, right? Because he was supposed to be the guy going into the season, but unfortunately he suffered an injury in camp, right, that didn't allow him to compete for the spot. So I'm looking forward to see you know, what he can bring. He was the guy that was brought in to, to be the franchise guy. A lot of high hopes uh, for him this season, and I'm looking at he's going to be fired up to go. I want to see I want to see him in action. I want to see you know what they build him up to be, and uh, I'm excited to see him along with this receiving core. Obviously, uh, Juwan Breskison's out, but you know, still a very potent lineup. You know, Ricky Collins, you know, kind of came out of nowhere. Not nowhere. But he was great in, in Edmonton. But, you know, you got Rodgers, you got um, DeVaris Daniels, all former Calgary receivers with their buddy Nick Arbuckle. So it should be lights out. We'll see. Winnipeg always finds a way to ruin plans. <laughs> well, you know what? There's an interesting Winnipeg connection to the team as well. And there was all sorts of you know, snide comments and jokes in the chat about Ryan Dinwiddie's first game as a coach being better than his first game as a quarterback because, of course, his first game as a quarterback was for the Bombers in the Grey Cup. Kind of a tough spot going yes. in, replacing Kevin Glenn. But I have to say, I mean, you know, as a guy, we remember him, and he's been, you know, obviously a very bright offensive mind running his way through the ranks to being, you know, a relatively young head coach in the league also had a lot of fire on the sidelines, certainly in that first game. Tough mm -hmm. to see being in the stadium last time. But I mean, what have you seen from Dinwiddie? And, um, you know, he had a big challenge because not only are you a first-year coach, but you're bringing in so many free agents and so many new players. Uh, yeah. What have you made of the job he's done so far in the direction of the team under Dinwiddie? I think he's done a phenomenal job. I mean, you know, you look at what the front office has done, you know, Pinball and uh, and Murphy, you know, bringing in so much talent from across the league, right? And in football, you always wonder, like, when you bring in a lot of talent, it doesn't always mesh right away. And that's the biggest challenge, you know, any coach has every season. But when you don't have a season last year and you bring this much uh, roster turnover, even from the 2020 season, uh, it's a challenge for any coach, and especially a rookie coach. I think he's done a phenomenal job of getting all the guys to buy into the roles. They have – you know, a lot of great leaders on the team. You look at Charleston, you look at Enoch Mwamba, um, Cameron Judge, uh, you look at uh, Eric Rogers. There's a ton of great leaders uh, in that locker room, and I think he's leaning on those guys, you know, to kind of set the culture uh, for what he wants. So I think he's done a great job. I mean, for uh, Coach Dinwiddie, I talked to him once I signed in Toronto in 2020, right? And, you know, it was he was getting ready to be his first-time head coach, and, you know, I loved everything. I heard the passion, the energy the ideas he had for the team, I was like, okay, I'm ready to play right now, right? Then that's the kind of um, that's the kind of coach he is. That's kind of, you know, the guys buying in. I'll talk to all my friends on the team. They all love him. They all think that, you know, he's got what it takes to, to, to lead a team. And that's the number one thing you need as a head coach is that belief from the players. If the players think that you have what it takes, they're going to do anything for you. So he's got that part down. Now it's time for to see what the results on the field. And I, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, pretty good results because if you have the guys behind you anything any anything you could do anything in this league uh, you know considering what happened last week and we've talked a lot about this young you know defensive secondary for the bombers that has played as well as they have in the first two games allowing only 13 points through two um and you know you kind of nailed it i mean john white was the mo biggest threat for the argos offense last week um I, what do you think that they'll do offensively particularly in the passing game to try to get more out and put more pressure on these young guys that 
you know, haven't played a lot of CFL football. No, you know what? They tried. I, you know, watching the game back, they tried. They had DeVars Daniels at least three times down the field open. They were just missed throws. And those are the kind of things as coaches, like, there's nothing you can really do because you've schemed up, you know, the, 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 the play uh, to perfection. I mean, those are double moves there. I think in the third quarter, DeVars Daniels, he would have, he's probably still running right now if that throw is completed. So as, as a coaching staff, I think the plan was good. They, they got John White involved, and that's something that needed to happen. Uh, early and often is just you know the, the passing portion of you know the attack didn't work out as well, but I didn't put it on the coaches. It was just an off night I feel for Mikhail Bethel Thompson, and you know if he had gotten the opportunity to play this week, I, I feel like he would have done a great job as well. But you know you saw in that fourth quarter when you know our buckle comes in, there was a little bit more life in the offense, a little bit more energy, and that's what I'm looking to look forward to, to seeing this whole game. Um, they've got to kind of you know have that like I said that balance attack right. John White here, John White in the screen game, DeVar Daniels deep, Eric Rogers, you know, kind of a possession uh, re- receiver type route. Ricky Collins screen passes here, Ricky pa- Collins deep. Just stay multiple, right? And, you know, these young defensive back, I know Nick Taylor's in that deep defensive back, but he's had a hell of a season so far. Um, you know, he, he's great at communicating, uh, but you got to keep him guessing. That's what the thing about young DBs is you've always got to keep him guessing. And Dinwiddie, I think he, they had a great plan last week. I look for more of the same, but just staying multiple, staying balanced. Argos analyst Natea Jay is our guest on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Kickoff Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Winnipeg time from BMO Field between the Bombers and the Argonauts. Tell me the truth, Natea. How much are people around the Argos enjoying looking at the standings and seeing the Ticats at 0-2? Oh, it's glorious. It's good. Anytime we see anything from, from Hamilton that, that, that isn't great, we love it. We're seeing uh, Bulldog having uh, uh, coaches, um, like, first to be fired odds up, and he's number one in those odds. And I, I think it's bizarre because a lot, Steinhauer is one of the best coaches in the league to me. But, you know, <laughs> you know anything to drum up for some controversy in, in, in Thai land, uh, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I just quickly have to clear something up. Now, you did say that you were moving. It has been pointed out in the chat that you're wearing a very nice golf shirt and a Titleist hat. Can you, uh, what will you say with the rumors that you're, in fact, on the road to play 18 right now? (laughs) No, honestly, I'm moving. Like, this is all moving stuff. Uh, That's funny that you say that because I have golf stuff in my car. And if I ever, you know... I drive by a driving range or, you know, my wife is, you know, you know, I tell her I'm going out for some milk, you know, you sneak in a quick nine, right? So I'm always ready to go. And I knew I was doing this interview. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to get home in time. So I had the golf stuff ready to go. So I just put it on and at least, it was, you know, I had to look a little professional for you, man. Hey, <laughs> looking good. Hey, this has been so much fun. Hey, tell us about the NFL podcast and what else you're doing outside your work in the CFL. Yeah, so I have the All Ball Podcast, and it's coming back this fall, you know, alignment with the NFL season. But it isn't just NFL. You know, we've got some uh, NBA guys coming up, some Raptors guys. Um, so we have some MLB guys. So, And uh, this year I'm looking at some NHL guys. So it's, uh, it's a fun podcast. It's, it's, it's trying to get to your level. You know what I mean? That's, that's, my, that's my goal. I'm trying to get to your level. Uh, in this game, uh, just starting now. So, you know, hopefully I'm trying to add a little different perspective uh, to, to the game, like kind of get what guys, you know, the time they were most nervous for a game or, you know, just be, you know, something beyond the stats, you know, having fun with it and, and showing a different light. My favorite, one of my favorite interviews was with uh, Trevor Harris, right? And uh, you see Trevor all the time. He looks serious all the time, right? But I was able to bring out, you know, his joking nature and his, uh, you know, practical joker. And people were, like, hitting me up, like, I never knew Trevor had a personality, right? And that made my day because that's what I want. I want you to know that, you know, there's more to you know, a lot of these guys than, you know, what you see. So uh, that's, that's kind of a little synopsis of what the podcast is all about. Well, I'll tell you what, dude, it wasn't too hard to bring out your personality. This was a really fun conversation. I hope this is the first of many with us talking CFL, NFL, and much more. Uh, have a great call tomorrow. Um, we'll 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 give a little more love to the Argos starting in week four after this home and home's done with the Bombers. But uh, looking forward to a good one and uh, good luck with everything, especially the move. I'm sure that's front and foremost on your mind right cool. now. And then tomorrow's game along. Say hi to Hoagie and uh, let's do this again soon today. Great to have you on the program. I appreciate it. And, you know, nobody likes to move, but you made me smile while moving. So thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) Have a great one. We'll do this again soon. There he is. Give him a follow on Twitter at T 
Ta Eleven. That's not Ta Ajay. He's in the booth with Mike uh, Hogan, the longtime voice of the Toronto Argonauts for tomorrow's game. And uh, man, just a really fun conversation, Ta Ta. He's going to do very well in this format as well as calling the games. As a former receiver, knows quite a bit about the Canadian Football League. All right, we are going to talk some NFL. The Hacksaw is back. Friday afternoons just don't seem right without talking to Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Lee will join us in a few minutes. Uh, before that, though, a cheers to our friend Dallas. I know he loves the little brown jug. He's getting married on the weekend, so uh, we will all hoist a 1919 or a summer lager to our friend Dallas this weekend. Uh, unfortunately, I know he was planning on uh, a bit of a golf game before the wedding. That might not happen today because of the weather. So uh, he might be in the clubhouse having a few little brown jugs. Uh, of course, when it's not pouring like it is outside, one of the great spots in this city to go for a beer with friends is the little brown jug patio at the brewery on William Avenue. You can see where the good stuff is made. You can pick it up to bring home. Great merchandise as well. And um, man, the, the patio is just a great spot to... You know, get it fresh out of the tap, uh, as well as with some entertainment. And of course, if you're thinking about an order and don't know where to go, you can get it at pretty much any bottle shop in Winnipeg, but you could also get it delivered right to your home. Go to the Little Brown Jug website at littlebrownjug.ca, order before 4 p.m., and you'll get same-day delivery right here in the city of Winnipeg. So uh, whether it's the Hefeweiz and the Summer Lager or the flagship 1919, Add a little brown jug to your weekend and uh, thank me later. Uh, Assiniboy Downs is back on Monday. More live racing. In the meantime, you can use the HPIBet.com app to bet on horse races from around the world. Remo and I will get going again on Monday with our duel at the Downs. Tightened it up a little bit this week. Um, and, of course, Listen Away Downs continues to be open seven days a week. VLT is open from 9 till 12.15, as well as the Terrace Dining Room open, although you will have to make reservations for that. As far as live racing goes, if you have your proof of vaccination, you can get in there with friends and family, hang out outside, both inside, and enjoy the races Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Live racing is at Assiniboia Downs. And uh, let's get a little golf update for our friends at Breezy Bend Country Club. If you haven't already thought about next season, why don't you think about making your golfing home Breezy Bend? You can give Corey Johnson a call at the club or find out more at breezybend.ca on being a part of Manitoba's most fabulous private club just outside the city of Winnipeg in Headingley. And, um, and they've done so many great things with the course. Trust me, you will love it. And um, the 18 holes are great. The 19th hole might be even better. And just a great social scene at Breezy Bend as well. As I said, talk to Corey. He'll hook you up and let you know what the story is for next year. But you will not be disappointed. As far as the PGA Tour goes, we are into the FedEx Cup playoffs. The top 125 players on tour battling it out. And no surprise that John Rahm, the number one player in the world is at the top of the leaderboard. Rom shot a four under 67 today. He's got a one shot lead over my guy, Tony Finau. Tony dropped a seven under 64 today. He's one shot back. And Justin Thomas, who was phenomenal with the 63 yesterday, had a terrible front nine, but bounced back. He finished two under. He and Keith Mitchell are one shot back. As far as the Canadians go, Mac Hughes, is six under. He's tied for 11th right now. And then you got to go a little ways down to find any other Canadians. And unfortunately, they're all right now on the wrong side of the cut line. Corey Connors is even. Cut looks to be minus one, so he'll need to do a little bit better. Tough day at the office for Roger Sloan, who is nine over. And Adam Hadwin, three over right now, will have to have a big back nine if he wants to play on the weekend. Um, all right, it has been too long, but the National Football League preseason is back. We got week two underway, and there is absolutely nobody we enjoy talking NFL and really generally sports with more than the legend himself, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, who joins us now from Southern California. Saw, what is going on? It's great to talk to you again. How are things uh, going in your neck of the woods these days? Good afternoon, Winnipeg and Hustler. How you doing? Long time no here. Yeah. Uh, exciting time, uh, obviously, with the NFL camps opening, preseason games underway, storylines here, there, and everywhere. And on top of that, we've, we've obviously got baseball pennant races, who's hot, who's not. We've got the Lakers and Clippers retooling their rosters, which is going to be a very interesting NBA season. And it's always time for me to talk hockey, where we got the Kings and the Ducks and a ton of young guys, but not a lot of recent success. So, yeah, 
there's a lot of stuff going on here on the West Coast. Well, and there always is at the website, LeeHacksawHamilton.com. If you're not checking that on a daily basis, you certainly should be. Um, Lee, before we get to some of the quarterback stories and you know battles around the league, let's talk about the two big off-season quarterback stories. And we'll get to Aaron Rodgers in a minute. But the Deshaun Watson saga has been... I mean, it was already a disaster in Houston, and this kind of was like putting gas on a fire into a massive inferno that's enveloped the entire club. What is the latest on this? And to be honest, how has he even been at camp? How did Deshaun Watson not end up on the commissioner's list like so many others that have gone before him? Good questions, uh, Andrew. I'll, I'll give you one word, paralyzed. I think everybody in the Deshaun Watson situation is paralyzed. Uh, the, the investigation continues by the Harris County Sheriff's Department, Houston Police Department, into the 22 women who filed misconduct litigation against Deshaun Watson. But there have been no charges that have been brought against the Houston Texans quarterback. So until the Houston police make their move, Andrew, I just don't think anybody else can do anything else. I don't think the commissioner at this point is ready to put him on the exempt list. Uh, the NFL has not interviewed him yet. The NFL has only interviewed two of the women who've made these sexual misconduct allegations against Deshaun Watson. The Houston Texans have said it's a league decision. The league is indicating it's a Houston and Harris County Sheriff's Department police decision. So until the first domino falls, I don't think anything else is going to happen with Deshaun Watson. The other factor is we are now under the third week of training camps, Andrew and the Texans are about to play their second preseason game, he has practiced on the side only five days. Uh, he's been away from camp because he's had police interviews. We're led to believe that the FBI is involved in this, that they've interviewed Watson, they've interviewed two of the women. There are allegations of an extortion case from a couple of the women that filed the lawsuits, Andrew. So that, that now is a piece of this landscape. So the end of the day, Houston's going to start their season Labor Day weekend or September 13th, actually. And we still don't know the definition of Deshaun Watson. Active on the roster, starting quarterback, backup quarterback, going to be on the roster but doesn't play. And the Texans are totally refusing to answer any questions about his status because either they don't want to or they don't know because it's got to come from the league. And the league says it has to come from the, the police and the sheriff's department. So... My word paralyzed, I think, kind of fits the conversation. Well, and, and it's the organization. It's also the general manager because sort of lost in all of this was the fact that before all this came up, he had demanded that he wanted out of town and they were shopping him and trying to figure out how much they could get. Needless to say, his value on the trade market with everything going on around him is about 10 cents on what should be a dollar. Yeah, I think the correct word is toxic. <laughs> and on, on until there's, you know, clarification as to what they're going to charge him with or maybe they're not going to charge him with anything. Or unless there is a out-of-court settlement to these, quote, 22 lawsuits, I just don't think he goes anywhere, plays anywhere. He's a big distraction. And Andrew Houston's got huge problems. You know, that new general manager, Nick Cesario, came from the New England Patriots. Their surprise hire as a coach is David Culley. And they ripped the roster apart. They signed 32 free agents in the offseason. At this point, more than a third of their roster in their training camp today is new. Hadn't been there before, hadn't played before, or played somewhere else before. Uh, it's I, th I think it's going to be a miserable season. Uh, the erosion of the season, ticket support. You know, at one point, Houston Texans had a huge line of people wanting to buy season tickets. That line is totally evaporated now. That's just not a good situation in Houston. You know, and this is a franchise that's dealing with the Deshaun Watson mess. They traded away J.J. Watt. They got rid of De DeAndre Hopkins. You know, the starting quarterback, if we were to play on, on Sunday, would be Tyrod Taylor, a journeyman at best. So I, th I think it's just going to be a miserable year in Houston. And I'm not talking about the summer weather. I'm talking about the football team. Uh, Lee Haxa Hamilton is with us. Uh, the other huge story, of course, is Aaron Rodgers. And I don't know if this guy that ended up getting the Jeopardy job didn't get canceled earlier. Maybe he wouldn't have reported to Camp Lee, but uh, he's there. He's a Green Bay Packer for another year. Seems to be, I mean, he knows that he is the Packers once he gets to Green Bay. And I think he still, you know, 
as we'll call it a confidence. Some others might refer it to as something else that knows he can go out and get the job done. But I mean, just your thoughts on everything that's transpired over the course of the summer and what does the future hold for the Green Bay Packers this season and then after this season is finished? Well, he will play this year. They had a three-year deal that was worth $66 million. The first year, though, was the only year that was guaranteed that was left on the contract. Now, they've restructured the contract. They've chopped off the third year. They've guaranteed him this year and next year if he wishes to play. If he does not, uh, they've also guaranteed him that they won't franchise tag and that he, he could leave at the end of 2022. I think they're going to evaluate the relationship between he and the general manager. This is not about Aaron Rodgers and Devontae uh, Adams, the wide receiver. This is not about Aaron Rodgers and the defense and all those great pass rushers. And this is not about Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur, who combined have a record of – trying to remember what the record was. It's it's like 26 and six during the regular season over the last two years. So there's there's no problems there. It's just that the, the relationship with the general manager and Aaron Rodgers thinks that because the franchise is wrapped around him and his ability that he should have some input as it relates to roster acquisitions, et cetera. I never thought they were going to trade him because of the salary cap hit they would have taken. Nobody would, nobody could take him on that late in the offseason because all their money was spent. And Green Bay did not want to take a $31 million salary cap hit. He has another MVP-type season. I think he probably stays. Now, if he does not have that kind of season, then maybe Green Bay moves on. I mean, all the one thing we know for certain, and this includes radio and TV and print, Careers come to a close. Does not matter what profession you're in. Careers come to a close, Andrew. And we can all speak from that from experience. Uh, <laughs> and that includes quarterbacks. Uh, maybe they move on from him. Uh, and maybe they let him walk and go somewhere else. I mean, who could have ever imagined today that Joe Namath would have left the New York Jets? Who could have ever imagined no Peyton Manning in Indianapolis? Or obviously, right there in his own backyard at Lambeau Field, who could have ever thought would see a day in which Brett Favre would go to the enemy, the Minnesota Vikings. So anything is possible. But I think once we get to opening day, he will be the guy, and we'll see if they can continue to grow this thing. I do get a sense, though, that they're allowing him to have some input in adding pieces. I think he was the catalyst behind the trade that brought back a pretty good route-running second wide receiver in Randall Cobb. He would like to have them add a little bit more insurance on the defensive side of the football, but they got some salary cap issues they're trying to address. But it'll be their opening day, and then we'll see what happens. Well, and, and you know, it's a kind of a good transition because we wanted to talk about a number of the other quarterbacks and camps around the league. Many people will say that this entire Rodgers saga started two years ago when they decided to not take a Justin Jefferson or some of the other players that were out there and take Jordan Love, a quarterback, in the first round. Um, presumably, that is the secession plan. What's the word on Love in Green Bay? Uh, he's, he took a lot of snaps leading up to the first preseason game. He played a lot in the first preseason game, and he got dinged in the first preseason game. I just think this is a, a bit of a project. You know, he played at Utah State. I got to see him three years in a row, and he had a great, great sophomore season, a bit of an up-and-down junior season, and then he opted to go to the NFL draft. He's not ready uh, in that, that last preseason game before he, he get banged and bruised his shoulder at the end. He had only one touchdown drive in seven possessions. So, I mean, he's he's work in progress and he's going to learn. And he may well be the future. I guess what, what really stunned me, that when this whole draft pick was made a year ago, and everybody in Green Bay, the beat writers, just went off, went crazy, had meltdowns. You know, you're, you're picking this quarterback of the future while we have an MVP quarterback. Well, memories are short or they're not paying attention. Because they had an MVP quarterback in Brett Favre, if you recall, and they chose Aaron Rodgers later in the draft, who'd been bypassed by everybody. And they groomed him and waited, you know, for Favre to time to tap out. And then they went to Rodgers. He became great. So I think it's much ado about nothing because everybody, regardless of what career we're in, you, me, or him, gets to the finish line and there has to be somebody in the pipeline. So we'll see if Jordan Love is the right guy. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I'll say on that is, that, and I sort of got the outrage on it, I mean, they had such an obvious need at receiver. There were some incredible receivers available. They passed on them, took a quarterback in the first round, and then with Aaron Ro Aaron Jones in the backfield with a new deal, drafted A.J. Dillon in the second round. It, 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 it didn't make a lot of sense to people on the outside, but that will be debated for a long time. There's a, an incredible rookie class 
of quarterbacks this year that are exciting a lot of people. But before we get to that, how's uh, the recovery of Joe Burrow going on? The previous season's number one overall pick that, you know, excited the fans in Cincinnati so much before he was uh, fell victim to uh, the Bengals' offensive line. Well, he, I think, is going to play this weekend. We'll find out. Did not play last weekend. Uh, the reports from the Bengals camp is uh, he, he's looked very tentative in the pocket. You know, he was last year, he was dynamic. He was bold. He was bracing. He was courageous. He made a ton of plays. But the end result is he took a lot of hits. I think he was sacked 43 times before he got hurt. And he really suffered a significant knee injury. And I mean, not only the sacks, but just the pressures and the hits were just constant because Cincinnati is such a bad franchise. The reports that I've gotten is he's really been tentative in the pocket, uh, in the pocket hustler. That you know, he's just his footwork isn't right. Uh, I'm not going to say he's gun shy because that's really unfair to the player. And I've never stood in the pocket in the te- face of the teeth of the rush. But you know, he's going to have to work through understanding he's going to get a hit again on that leg. Uh, or he's going to have to move the pocket, and what will he be like when he moves the pocket? Up until about two days ago, he really had not had a good camp. Then they had an 11-on-11 scrimmage. He still wore the red jersey, and you couldn't touch him. But he stood in there, and he finally made some plays. So I believe he is going to play. Maybe he's going to start this weekend for Cincinnati, and then we'll just see how he progresses. But, you know, that this is on the Bengals. This is not on that kid. That kid is a great player. That kid's a heck of a citizen and a real firebrand of a leader. He went to my alma mater, Ohio University. Uh, I, I just, I think that it's a failure, an organizational failure. When, when the hell is the last time the Bengals were in the playoffs? Please tell me when they last won a playoff game. It's, it's an organizational failure. They got this, this kid battered and they finally got this kid hurt. Hopefully, maybe they'll be a little bit better. Maybe he'll be a little bit wiser to get the ball out of there. Don't stand there and try to be courageous and make a play knowing you're going to take punishment. But we'll we'll get a much better feel this weekend. We get through the games on Sunday night, and if he goes out there and if he goes 10 for 19 and throws for 112 yards and doesn't take any hits, I think then he will have sold himself that, yes, he is back. Lee, uh, he'll actually be thrown to his former LSU teammate from that national championship team, Jamar Chase, who was an early first round pick. But the first round was dominated by quarterbacks. Uh, we got Trevor Lawrence in Jacksonville, Zach Wilson in New York, Trey Lance in San Francisco. Those were the top three picks. Justin Fields a little bit later. And then, of course, the interesting battle between Mac Jones and Cam Newton in New England. Um, let's give us a little rundown of the uh, the class of 2021 in the uh, the quarterback section. A great time to be doing talk radio. <laughs> I mean, you got quarterback controversies, quarterback competitions, quarterback debates everywhere. <laughs> uh, let's start with Trevor Lawrence. Uh, he was okay. He was adequate in his first preseason game with the Jaguars, the Clemson star. Uh, he doesn't have a good team around him. I think it's going to be a long season. I think it's going to be a shocker of a season for him who lost only one game in his college career at Clemson, and for his coach, Urban Meyer. You know, when he was at Ohio State, when he was at Florida, he had the equivalent of 25 blue-chip players on his roster every year. He didn't have that luxury now in Jacksonville. You know, they started this past weekend uh, with Trevor Lawrence in the game. They started the same group offensively up front around him that lost 15 in a row last season, and he didn't have a great game. I think he threw for 63 yards. It might have been seven for 12, going through a bit of a a learning curve. So it's going to take time. Uh, I just hope he doesn't get battered along the way like Joe Burrow did. (coughs) Joe Burrow did uh, last season. Uh, Zach Wilson out of BYU has had kind of a a up and down camp with the New York Jets. A lot expected from him. A lot needed from him. Jets, Jets have had a messy couple of weeks. They've lost three starters on their offense already with injuries. He didn't play real well in his first preseason game. But then again, he didn't practice a lot because he had some nicks and bruises too. I just think it's going to be a steep learning curve for him. I mean, the one thing I like about him is, is he's fiery. Uh, he has no fear. He makes plays down the field. He moves the pocket. Real smart guy. But that being said, when your left tackle isn't practicing and he's the best player on the offensive front and he's got injury issues, they just lost their right guard who walked out of camp and retired because of concussion problems. And they've had a lot of other issues with some of their other players. I just think it's going to be a hard year uh, for Zach Wilson. Uh, you mentioned Mac Jones. 
this is this is an evolving story. Uh, it's year two of Cam Newton. Cam played really well last night, went eight for nine, throwing the football for 103 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Mac Jones has had back-to-back -back good games. Mac Jones has thrown for, I think he threw for 149 last night. On the weekend before, I think he threw for 123. No interceptions at all. Uh, he's composed in the pocket. He's got a strong arm. He, he's obviously got control of the huddle. They really like his leadership ability. Uh, so we had, we had a kind of a, a quarterback competition there. I don't know if Cam Newton is going to lose a starting job because he seems in the second year, he seems to be in a lot better situation. But boy, I'll tell you what, you look at Josh McDaniels and his impact on Mac Jones right now, that's pretty impressive, just two preseason games in. So I bet they both wind up playing. Uh, you know, last year I was really critical of the Patriots because they were they were praising Cam Newton and he threw eight touchdown passes in an entire season and they didn't make the playoffs and had a they had a wretched year. Well, they've added a lot of people around those quarterbacks now because they led the world. They won the offseason in terms of spending money and signing free agencies. If Cam is different in year two with Josh McDaniels, he's probably the guy. If he falters or if he gets dinged, Mac Jones will be the guy. But boy, I tell you what, what we've seen from the first couple of weeks with Mac Jones has been pretty impressive. Uh, Jordan Love was one one touchdown drive in seven possessions. First game, Green Bay, kind of erratic. Uh, you mentioned Trey Lance. Uh, he threw an 80-yard touchdown pass in the first preseason game for the 49ers. It was more a heave than it was anything else. He was four for 13 the rest of the time in that game. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, I think, is going to be the guy that Lance is going to play. The other thing is Garoppolo has got to prove, Andrew, that, that he can stay on the field. Uh, there's uh, The Chicago story might be as surprising as the New England Mac Jones story. Justin Fields came off the bench last week and threw for 143 and ran for 32 yards. And that's that's pretty dynamic stuff for the first time out of the box. Uh, he did get banged up. He is going to play this weekend in the Bears' second preseason game, so we'll see see if he continues to progress along that line. Andrew Dalton is there. He's the insurance policy veteran. And if, if Fields can't play well or Fields gets hurt, Dalton will be back in there as the starter. And the last one I'll mention. Who do you think gets week going? one? Just pay before we move off uh, off Chicago for a second, is Andy Dalton the week one guy? And will they let Fields sort of, you know, wait a few weeks? Or do you think they go with Fields right off the bat? If Fields has a good game two and then follows it with a good game three, I think Fields might be the quarterback. But. That's an awful lot, Andrew, to ask a rookie. That's really hard. Um, I, 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 they got a good insurance policy. Andy can make them competitive. Andy doesn't make a ton of mistakes, and I, you know, I, I don't think they go wrong if they just gave the ball to Andy Dalton and went slow growth uh, with Justin Fields. Uh, and the other one I wanted to mention was the Indianapolis situation because Carson Wentz got hurt about third day of practice with a, a minor fracture. Uh, of the foot. Now, they think he might be ready opening day, but he's not practicing yet. Uh, but what happened this weekend was kind of interesting. The young backup, Jacob Eason, the former Washington Husky, who's hardly ever played in the league, had a really good game. And then they went to the other quarterback, Sam Ellinger from Texas A&M. He lit it up, threw the ball, moved the pocket, ran some read uh, pass option stuff. He was impressive. So both those guys are going to play again this weekend. I, I don't know if Indianapolis would go with a two-quarterback system if it's Eason and Ehlinger to start the season if Wentz is not ready. But right now, at least in weekend one, <laughs> those two Colt backups did was, was kind of surprising. You know, Lee, it's funny you just stand on the Colts for a minute. There was so much excitement of Carson Wentz coming in and reuniting with Frank Reich and what he could do in his second act. And that week that he was hurt, it wasn't just Wentz, arguably their next most important player one of the top linemen in the league, Quentin Nelson, went down with a similar foot injury that was characterized as anywhere from 5 to 12 weeks. I guess the good news for Colts fans is it looks like both of those players have a chance of playing week one. And I'll tell you what, even if Wentz isn't able to go, if you're either one of those young quarterbacks behind center, you'd feel a lot better going out to the field if you know the Quentin Nelson's in front of you. Well, Nelson had almost the exact same type of injury that the quarterback once had. They repaired it. Now, now they're kind of talking that Nelson may play on opening weekend. Indy's got another problem. They don't have a left tackle. Their left tackle retired Anthony Constanzo because of a neck injury. And who they are running through their left tackle, they've not held up, not played very well so far. So 
we get we got three weeks to go in the sea before the season starts. We've obviously got games this weekend. Next weekend's the final preseason. Everybody gets a bye week the first weekend of September. So they've got three weeks to hope that Nelson gets back 100%. And they better figure out who can be my left tackle. And nobody's going to give you a left tackle now. It's got to come from within that organization. But uh, Indy was Indy was quite, quite a story last year. I was a little bit surprised. Philip Rivers elected to walk away at the point he did. Uh, Indy went out and got the quarterback. Now, you know. Wentz is, is Wentz qualified? Well, he was once upon a time. He's working with Frank Reich, whom he worked with in Philadelphia. But he's got to stay healthy. I mean, that, and so he's had two significant injuries now in two years' time. Lee Hacksaw Hamilton is with us. Uh, everyone in the chat excited to see the Saw back with us on the Friday afternoon. It certainly is great. And I had a listener that's uh, in Temecula that used to be listening to you back on the old, the mighty, was it the mighty 1090 in San Diego? Yes. Hacksaw. <laughs> so uh, anyways, people loving that. Let me ask you about this. And I don't want, let's, no COVID takes in the chat, please. Um, vaccines and the NFL. I mean, we've heard controversial statements by Cole Beasley and DeAndre Hopkins and certainly a lot of Viking fans around these parts not too pleased with Kirk Cousins' take on it all. But uh, is the NFL making progress with getting their players vaccinated? Uh, what are you hearing on that? Well, multiple things. Uh, NFL players should message Deion Dawkins, tackle from the Buffalo Bills, who did not get vaccinated and he got sick. He was in ICU for four days. He was really sick. He has just been released. He's way behind in conditioning. I don't know if Deion Dawkins is going to start the season. That is a big issue. Uh, I guess the thing that sets me off, and this is above my pay, pay grade, your pay grade, NFL players' pay grade, the science of the vaccine. NFL players, Andrew, have access to the greatest health care in the world. They have better health care than you and me employed. They got great doctors. They have great health care for health and injuries. And they have access to every piece of information that might be available as it relates to the virus deviants that we're dealing with globally and nationally and here in the U.S. and you up in Canada. And a lot of players just haven't taken time from their busy lives at partying or working out to try to gather that information. How can that be? Um, I went off on the Chargers. At one point, the Chargers had 48% vaccinated when they finished up their OTAs. How can that be? Is nobody, Andrew, checking the out-of-town scoreboard? 648,000 people dead. Is nobody, you didn't want to talk about the deviant, but is nobody looking at the out-of-town scoreboard? The CDC said since June 1st, 99% of the people in hospitals were unvaccinated. And 99.3% of those who died since June 1st, Andrew, were never vaccinated. So I just asked the question, what are you players doing? And you're in this closed environment, and the league did a great job last year uh, stomping out the fires. And as we went along, and you and I talked about this a great time on your show, as we went along, the, the, the league learned a lot about how to, how to deal with testing, how to deal then with close contact testing, and how to, how to stop it. It was bad in Baltimore, it was bad in Tennessee. They had their mini outbreaks. We had the situation in Denver where they had to, had to use four different quarterbacks and then use a wide receiver quarterback. And obviously you got the mess in Minnesota with Kirk Cousins in, his, in that quarterback room. But how the players would not understand the, the depths and the seriousness of this or not even search out the information. Uh, some people within the union would like to have everybody vaccinated. The NFL would sure like to have it. The NFL has 100% of all league employees, people that work in New York and Park Avenue, and everybody that works for every organization, every staff member, every front office executive, every employee, Andrew, is vaccinated. Now, the NFL is at about 90% now. Atlanta became the first team to get to 100%. But there are stragglers still. There are still stragglers that might have 70% or 80%. I just asked those players. How could you not do this to protect yourself, to protect your family, and to pr protect, obviously, everybody that's in and around your locker room? So I, I don't think the league can mandate it. There is pressure points that the union should mandate it. Uh, one of the player reps yesterday went public and said he is of the opinion that the league should test every player every day, whether that's vaccinated players or unvaccinated. New protocol this year, Andrew, if you're a vaccinated talk show host, 
you get tested one every 14 days. If you're unvaccinated, you get tested every day and you have to wear a mask every day and you're separated from your teammates. You can't even eat in the lunchroom. Uh, if you go on the road with your uh, team and you're unvaccinated, Andrew, uh, you, you can't leave the hotel. Uh, but, but one of the player reps went public yesterday and said he disagrees with the way this new protocol is. He wants them back and everybody to be tested. The problem is it, it costs the league, uh, I, want, I want to say, over a million dollars to test every day. This new theory, this new program, it costs about $400,000 each team to test the unvaccinated guy. So uh, this thing is fluid. Uh, union could still invoke some new rules. The union, I think, like to buy into some new rules. The owners, or John Mara, the Giants, said yesterday he would wish the union would come front and center until every one of their employees, every one of the 90 guys on the field, on the roster, could get vaccinated. It's a long answer for something you didn't want to talk about, but you asked the question, I give you the answer. No, for sure. I wanted to talk about it with you, just unfortunately that in today's day and age, and probably less so here than in the ultra-politicized environment that you guys have south of the border, the minute you bring up this topic, it can go completely off the rails very quickly. So I'm glad we got the goods from you, Hacksaw, and we will leave it at that. Hey, listen, just before we go, um, you know, you are following all of the sports and writing on it. I just have to ask you, being there in Southern California, uh, of course, you're following the Padres very closely. But as a guy that has spent this many years in this occupation, following sports 24-7, how much fun have you had watching what Shohei Otani is doing this year for the Anaheim Angels? Tell you what, Babe Ruth was a long time ago. We've all seen the videos of the greatness of Babe Ruth. I wrote a column about Otani a couple of weeks ago. I mean, this, this is a renaissance man. I don't think we'll ever see this again. I mean, Bo Jackson, when he did double duty as a great running back in the NFL on a bit of a power hitter with the White Sox and Kansas City Royals, that was pretty impressive. And obviously what Neon Dion did in Atlanta as a running back and as, a, as a NFL defensive back with the Falcons. But this guy is doing this every day of the week. And I, I mean, the league, the, the 162 game schedule is such a grind. And the preparation for these players is unbelievable. And the wear and tear factor is in again another solar system. And for Otani, to be an everyday designated hitter and go through all the all the batting practice he has to do and still take ground balls or fly balls in case he has to play in the field as an emergency player. And then to prepare for his next start because you've got to throw between starts, you do bullpens, you do all types of stuff. For him to hold up what will be a 162 game schedule and really never have a bad slump. He just, you know, he's, he's gone past the 40 home run mark and have no setbacks at all on the mound. I mean, his ERA is like 3.28. His record, I think, is 7-1. and one. Other night, he pitched an eight-inning game and also hit a home run. I mean, this is a renaissance man beyond a doubt. So, and Babe Ruth was, that was so long ago. And Babe Ruth only did it for four years or five years with the New York Yankees in the early 1900s. So, and then he just became a superstar in right field. But what Otani is doing. It's just spectacular when you consider the physical demands on a player today and what he has to do to get ready to play this position or to be the DH or to be a pitcher. I mean, he's doing just like being double duty all the time. It's, I mean, it's spectacular. And we're right in the middle of a Dodger pennant race and the Padres chasing the Dodgers and the Giants and West Coast spotlight. It's really kind of taken over control of Major League Baseball. But uh, Otani ought to be getting more national recognition uh, than he is anywhere. We'll tell you this fun story real quick. You know, in Japan, he's an icon. I mean, he now is what Ichiro Suzuki was when Ichiro first got here to Seattle. And in Japan, they televise the games that he starts. And the minute he's pulled from the game, they leave the, leave the broadcast to go back to local programming on the Japanese network. Uh, but he's held up to the barrage because, I mean, there is a contingent of Pacific Rim reporters from Japan and Korea who travel who are baseball beat writers. And that's all they do is focus on Otani. And he does, does separate press conferences. I mean, it's, it's the most fascinating thing to see. We're going to see him in a week or so because the Padres play the Angels. Renaissance man. Yeah, you don't miss that one there, Hacksaw. Uh, folks, if you haven't already checked out the site, it's leehacksawhamilton.com. I know Remus just threw it up in the chat. 
make sure you check that out. Uh, Lee, thanks so much for doing this. The season's just about here. Let's do this again very soon. Have an awesome weekend, my friend. Uh, Mike, great to talk to you guys up there in Winnipeg. And, hey, hockey training camps will be opening soon, too, so that's kind of cool. And uh, check the website. I uh, write on it every day and hope to talk again before the season starts. Thanks, Hustle. Thanks, Saw. Have a great weekend. There he is, the one and only Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. And, uh, Matt, I've been paying attention to the chat. Great to see everyone having some fun today. Uh, do us a favor, though, if you're with us. Hit that thumbs up button. We've got... Very low likes for today's show. I'm liking today's show. I thought we had some great CFL talk, and it's always great when Hacks is on with us. So if you would be so kind, give us a, a thumbs up there if you're with us on YouTube, and it, make sure that you're subscribed. I want to give a special uh, welcome to, I believe it's Northside YEG. That would be Edmonton, who uh, jumped on here after the Rod Peterson show. Great to have you with us, Northside. And I know there's another 780 person. So uh, great to have some folks from Edmonton here feeling a little bit better about the Elks after that big win last night. Um, anyways, we're going to get to the cool vet lines in a minute. Stick around uh, for people in Winnipeg, just because I'm going to be dropping this off for a pickup. We do have a, a fun way to end the program with the little marble race, which is a favorite of ours here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. But let's get Michael Rivas back in here before we get to the cool vet lines, uh, because... Did want to get to this, and we kind of sort of got sidetracked with a lot of uh, Bomber, Argo talk, and then Hacksaw right away. There is some Jets news. We've been talking about this throughout the week. If Jenny Svechnikov, the former Detroit Red Wing first-round pick, is signing with the Jets, and it's interesting. Uh, you can reported that it was going to be a PTO was offered, uh, and I talked to Ken. He said he believed that it would be officially announced at some point today, and... The PTO, well, let's get Remus in here and we'll get Ken's tweets up here. But I think the PTO gives them the opportunity to, um, you know, maybe spend a little bit more time before officially signing Svechnikov. I would have a feeling they've probably got a bit pretty good idea of what the deal is going to be. And then potentially even put them on the roster after opening day, which uh, may have some cap advantages for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Remus, why don't you uh, read out these tweets from Ken and we can discuss. Yeah, the Moose announced it's a one-year AHL deal with forward Evgeny Svechnikov, at least for the time being. The 19th overall pick in the 2015 draft has accepted a PTO to attend Jets training camp, and he will be given an opportunity to earn a two-way NHL deal when healthy. The AHL salary for Svechnikov is 215000 If he can earn an NHL deal with the Jets, one would expect the AAV will be close to the league minimum given the salary cap gymnastics that we will be required this season. That's Ken Weeb on Twitter at Weeb's World. The Moose did announce announce it with a nice graphic. Here I can pull it up. But yeah, that's so that's where it is. People are people were asking. Ken had the you know mentioned it last week. Uh, you asked him about it earlier this week, and here it is official. The Moose signed him to a one year deal. So uh, interesting, uh, interesting signing there. Yeah, and it's one. I mean. The thing that stands out to me, uh, last week I was on uh, the big show with uh, the guys in Calgary. I think it was either Wednesday or Thursday I was doing the shows there. And we were talking about, you know, remaining UFAs that were still out there. And we were speaking more from a Flames perspective, but you're going down the list. And like Svechnikov's eight or nine years younger than just about everybody available as a free agent right now. I mean, everyone else is 34, 35, hoping to do something else. I mean, this is a guy that was 25 years old and was a first round pick. So... I mean, I really do think that there is the potential that he could come in and sort of restart his National Hockey League career. And what's interesting, Remus, is that he and Pierre-Luc Dubois played together and had some real significant success as junior players. Now, that certainly doesn't guarantee anything in the National Hockey League. But, you know, considering some of the struggles that Dubois had last year, finding, you know, some line mates that really worked with him, you know, I think there's a lot of potential that this can be a very low-risk High upside signing for the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, I just pulled, you know, pull up his hockey DB. Uh, you know, I can't say I've seen too much of the player firsthand, but I mean, 19th overall pick. Obviously, people thought he had talent back in 2015. He's got 12 points in 41 NHL games. You know, didn't really play. He played that's or he played 21 games. So, I mean, this is a depth signing. Maybe a guy who offers some upside. He's got a relationship with Dubois, and sometimes that can definitely be helpful. So. Uh, let's see how it goes. He's battled injuries. Maybe he can be 100% healthy. I think Ken mentioned a shoulder injury in his tweet, if I recall. Let me just say it was, this is what he said, um, yeah, this morning at 10.10, he said, 
Um, the mutual interest led to a pro tryout offer, and he had a shoulder issue cleaned up in May, and the expectation is he should be cleared to play around training camp. So once healthy, look for a two-way deal. So he's got, what, the pro try with the Jets, the contract with the Moose. Seems like a, a nice contract with the Moose, 215 k And I think that's something, has for a player who's kind of like a fringe guy, if you think you're going to be going up and down a lot, why not sign with the Moose? Um, first of all, it's a nice AHL salary. And what, if you get sent up and down, you don't have to move anywhere. And I think we talked with Toninato about that before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think we, can, we can't understate how much of a bonus that is compared to some of the other teams for a fringe player who's looking, you know, knows he's going to be spending time on both. To not have to move, not have to worry about that stuff. I think it's huge. Yeah, no, no, it is. I mean, the advantages of having the American League team here in Winnipeg are uh, far more than twofold, but that is certainly something that I think helps them when they're attracting players that might be on the bubble that could be spending some time in both leagues. Um, So it is official he is coming to the organization. As of right now, it's a moose deal and a PTO. I think the smart money is on a two-way deal being signed right around the beginning of the season. Um, and obviously through training camp, we'll see where Sveshnikov fits and where he might be within the organizational hierarchy once we get to dropping the puck on the season. So uh, nice work to Kenny Weeb. Rima, would that count as a, as a Weeb bomb today? A <laughs> Weeb bomb, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess so. Yeah, I'm gonna say yes. That was a weeb. That's, that's that a, a weeb, weeb bomb. bomb. Yeah, there was uh the the Billick had the Billick bomb earlier. I'm not sure we ever really gave him the proper credit on the program yes. for because uh, I think he was the first guy that was sniffing around and knew of Brendan Dillon coming to the Nate program. Schmidt. So yeah, and then Nate Schmidt. Remember course, when Nate so. when Nate Schmidt like was reported that he wasn't gonna waive his no trade and everyone came in <laughs> chat saying I hate Nate Schmidt. Screw that guy. <laughs> and now it's like now, our most most viewed... popular jet by far. By far, you put anything on Nate Schmidt on YouTube, getting thousands of views. People are searching. People love Nate Schmidt. Every comment says seems like such a fun guy, and uh, yeah, we're excited about Nate Schmidt. That was uh, that was a fun like two days uh, before free agency with all the Jets moves. So uh, another another one here for the Jets. All right, um, we will be doing a marble race, Bardo. Don't you worry. I'm gonna get you in. Uh, presuming that you're in Winnipeg, we'll start off with you. We'll get everyone to just to pop in the ch- in the in the chat. But do us a favor. Let us know you're here. Hit that thumbs up button. In the meantime, uh, let's quickly get to the cool bet lines, and then we've got a few other topics to hit before we finish it off with a marble race for our great sponsor, the official Spirit of the Bombers Canadian Club. Uh, all right, three games remaining in the CFL this week. Uh, credit to you, Remo. You said it on Monday when we first took a look at these lines. If you want Montreal, get it now because they were an underdog. They were plus money to win the game, and you were getting two points. That number ballooned the other way. Montreal yesterday afternoon was a five-point favorite. It stabilized a little bit, but still the Alouettes, four-point favorites as the Calgary Stampeders will start a rookie quarterback in the place of Bo Levi Mitchell tonight. Money line is Calgary plus 160 at home and the Alouettes minus 200. Um, Earlier this week, the other thing we noticed that the Bomber Argo total was very low, 41 and a half. I went over on that on the lock shop on Wednesday morning. I'm not going to take any credit for moving the line, but it's moved a lot. Uh, Four points to be exact. Over under is now 45 and a half for the Bombers and Argos. And the point spread that was Bombers minus five is now down to minus three. So if you're on the over, not as good a time to bet it right now. But if you do like the Bombers to cover the number, you're getting a much better line today than you did earlier in the week. Bombers three-point favorites against the Argos. And the final game tomorrow, it started out as 11. It's now 10 and a half for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. That was another one of my picks on the lock shop. I like Bombers, Argos over 41 and a half. I guess it was 42 by the time we did the show. And I like the Riders to cover 11. So I like them to cover 10 and a half even more. I think it's going to be a long, long day, night at Mosaic Stadium uh, for our friends Paul Apolise and for Matt Nichols. Um, Northern Trust is going on right now as well. Um, you can probably check out the updated odds throughout the weekend. And then we do have some NFL preseason tonight. Uh, my Chiefs taking on the Cardinals. Uh, The WFT, home to the Bengals. Doesn't look like they'll be playing Joe Burrow tonight. uh, Just reading reports, so we'll see on that. Anyways, there's not anything much more DGEN than betting the NFL preseason, but it's all there if you want to. And don't forget, let's just see if 
the Jets are still 50 to one to win the cup because um, we talked about that yesterday. Has there been any movement? No, nope, they're still 50 to one right there with the Canucks, Blackhawks and Flames. So if you are someone that, you know, regularly likes to put 10 or 20 bucks on your team before the season starts, it's anywhere from 33 to 40 at most books. It's 50 at cool bet right now. So if you're going to make that bet, yeah. you're crazy not to do it there. Use promo code WST. If you've never bet at cool bet before, it'll get you a hundred percent bonus on your first deposit all the way up to 200 bucks. What were you going to say on that? Rick? I, I need to, to bet on that right now, just for the value uh, purposes. Oh, by the way, there's yeah. one other thing, and we will not be talking politics on this this program. But if you are someone that is interested in politics, betting on politics is huge in Britain. Uh, and I couldn't help but notice oh, that no. there are federal election odds right now at Cool Bet. And uh, liberals are a heavy, heavy favorite, <laughs> minus 1250. <laughs> Conservatives are six to one. The NDP is 100 to 1. The Bloc Québécois, 150. Green, 200. People's Party, 500 to 1. But there are some, like, for people that are really into this, uh, and I know a few of them, I'm sure they'll be looking at, you know, Green Party, number of seats, one over one and a half. Uh, Liberal Party, number of seats. So, anyways, all that's there. If that is something that you are interested in, you can bet it now at Cool Bets on the front page under Federal Election. And even if you just want to go there and bet that, use WST. You can double your first deposit up to $200. All right. Speaking of that WFT, Reem, yesterday I tweeted about this. The Washington football team has narrowed down their final selection of possible names. And to me, the name that they should go with is the name that they already have. I hope that they do not change from Washington football team. I I'm completely in on WFT. I love the jerseys. I love the numbers on the helmet. I think they're unique. I think it stands out. And I think they'd be nuts to change it. Where are you at? Here, here's the list of the names that they have. They're all terrible. Uh, let me throw it. Washington, Armada, Presidents, Brigade, Red Hogs, Commanders, Red Wolves, Defenders. W I'm in for WFT. I agree. I like WFT. It's great. Great name. I'm down with WFT. The one there was a name that I'm surprised didn't become a finalist, and that was Red Tails. And the Red Tails has a very interesting connection. I believe it was a group of Navajo airmen for the United States in one of the one of the wars um, that you know were three C Purple Hearts. You know, a very famous group of uh, of people that you know of, of indigenous background that did great things for the United States that, you know, if they're going from their old name to something else that's relatively similar, you could do it. The Red Hogs is sort of funny. I mean, if you're old enough, I'm barely old enough to remember the uh, Washington teams of the 80s that had the Hogs, which was the offensive line, and they were sort of the identity of the team. So that is pretty interesting. But I just, you know what, at the start, I'm like, oh, they're going to be the Washington football team. That's kind of corny. And then throughout last year, it grew on me. And now, honestly, I'd be really disappointed if they didn't stay with it. I think it's unique. I think it is, uh, it's classy, it's simple, and it focuses on all the good things about the team other than the conversations that were around their old name. And uh, honestly, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think they're onto something good there. So I hope that they will stay with that. Um, big wrestling weekend. And often... You know, before WrestleMania or even SummerSlam, I'll bring somebody on. We've got so much football to talk about. We didn't do it. Uh, but Reem, John Cena's back. Roman Reigns, they're going at it. And I think the SummerSlam uh, main event, which I believe is tomorrow. And then, of course, people that have been uh, maybe lapsed fans will remember CM Punk and all the controversy he has caused uh, by leaving WWE, I think, like eight years ago and having a very unsuccessful UFC career. Uh, it sounds like he's going to be back. Widely rumored that he'll be back in the ring along with uh, the Winnipeg guys, Jericho, Omega, and the rest of the stars of the AEW who have a special broadcast tonight on TNT. And I think you can see that on TSN around 10 o'clock. Yeah, big wrestling weekend. I'm really intrigued by um, what AEW is doing. I mean, no one's really made a dent in WWE for a while. And I think people are kind of um, find their product stale. And WWE or AEW's got a new product. and. I saw a video of Jericho walking into the ring and the whole crowd 
sang his theme song. He didn't even have a theme song. That was amazing. That is that was such a cool and and I will say this about Chris Jericho, a great one of the great most famous Winnipeggers and the greatest exports our city's ever produced. That song that they're singing is of his own band, Fozzy. So Jericho, it, you know, listen, I think anyone that's a star like that has a bit of an ego. I'm not sure you could have a better situation, whether you're going into the ring as a star for over 20 years in wrestling and having four or 5,000 people without the background music singing every single word of one of your songs from your other gig when you're a musician. It really was cool. And I got to tell you, that just speaks to the impact that Chris Jericho has had, both in wrestling and in music. And it continues to grow with the growth of AEW. Now, was that intentional that they didn't play his music? Or did someone like did someone hit the mute button? Yeah, no, that was that was part of... Um, he was going through a, a long series of matches to finally fight his arch rival MJF and... Part of the rules of this final match was that he was not able to use his finishing move. And I can't remember what it's called. It was some sort okay. of spinning move, something to do with Judas. And that song, Judas, they were also not allowed to play it before the oh, match. So yeah. they really pumped it up saying the fans are going to be singing it. And they sort of challenged the fans to do it, but they did it. And if you've seen the video, it really is cool. And it's a hell of a good song, too. I mean, they, uh, they're they on to something there. But it's been amazing to see Tony Khan who, of course, is the son of Shad Khan, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, started up. And, I mean, they went through all of this time with the pandemic in Jacksonville at that Daly's place, um, doing many of the events. And now they're getting out there. They're in Chicago this weekend. So wrestling fans are going to have a lot to talk about this weekend. And, of course, SummerSlam on Saturday night. Uh, one, And this will be interesting. I'm not sure if the Earl is with us right now. Earl is a – oh, the Judas effect. Thank you, Justin and Kenny's water bottle. Um, the uh, – a couple things to get to before uh, before we finish. Um, but if the Earl is here right now, uh, I'd love the Earl's take on this. The sports card industry uh, is in another big up. Well, we'll see. I'm not sure how up it is right now, but throughout the pandemic, it certainly was. And anyways, anyone that's ever collected tops baseball cards knows that top is tops is synonymous with Major League Baseball. Out after 70 years, announced yesterday that Major League Baseball and the MLBPA have punted tops and are going with Fanatics, who, as far as I know, is an online merch retailer. So this has obviously sent shockwaves throughout a multi-billion dollar industry. I'm curious how this is going to work. I mean, is um, Fanatics going to acquire tops now? Like, are they going to just start making cards? I don't know how you can punt tops after so long. I don't like what Fanatics has done. They've kind of taken over the the industry to make the replica jerseys for hockey and make all the apparel now. But I'm not a big Fanatics guy, but there's more money here. I think the players have a share of it. They're going to try to get other leagues in um, in this Fanatics card brand and shut out some of the other brands. So I'm not I'm not a huge fan, but let's see where it's going. I saw a lot of people who are mad on very mad online about it. I mean, tops again, 70 years. Been around forever, synonymous with cards. This is the big upswing. Um, I don't know, are they going to buy tops now? Is that the next move? They have a couple years to figure this out, um, and we'll see how it goes. I'm, but I don't, I don't see this as a uh, as a good thing for the uh, card industry. And also, as for our hobby shops, I mean, are are the cards only going to be available at Fanatics stores, or will um, you know? Or Ooh, the that's a great question. Is that, I never gonna, even thought yeah, about that. I but saw, that is. I saw people tweeting like, are they going to leverage their retail stores like Lids now and their online store distribute the cards rather than having you know the current hobby shop uh, system? I think that is something uh, that that's intriguing as well as part of the. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I'm having a hard time. I mean, tops not having baseball cards is like OnlyFans not having sexually explicit content. And yes. that apparently is what's happening right oh, now. Can, can oh, we just <laughs> what what a segue? Uh, there you go. Whoa, there. very um, very well done. Very well I, done. I I I just <laughs> this whole OnlyFans business. Uh, um, and people are familiar with OnlyFans. I will. I am of course familiar with it. You see all the links on social media. I have never actually gone to OnlyFans or made an OnlyFans purchase. But I do understand that millions of people, um, you know, pivoted to OnlyFans to make a living during the pandemic and have done very, very well for it. 
Apparently only fans due to the wants of their investors are going to ban sexually explicit content to which I say, what is there going to be left? Like three or four accounts? Um, I, I, I just don't understand this strategy. And if they do that, obviously someone else will pick it up going forward. Um, this, well, I, I won't make some of the, the comparisons I said to you off air Remus, but, uh, I will say this is a bit of a head scratcher that, uh, that only fans is deciding to go, uh, a bit more clean in PG. Like what the hell are they going to have on this site now? That's yeah. not available everywhere else on the internet. That's a great question. Us, uh, I don't know. I mean, I saw Tumblr try to do the same thing. I mean, Tumblr was known for explicit content as well. You know, they propped up the value, then they sold it. And, you know, sorry, then they banned the explosive content and sold it. And now Tumblr is, is nothing. So I, I don't know. OnlyFans has kind of been built on this adult, being an adult site for adult performers to sell, you know, sell themselves. And now they're saying, no, I guess they're having trouble getting funding. The banks don't want to be associated with them. But, I mean, know, know your lane. This is where your lane has been built up. And they're trying to pivot. Like, what are people going to use OnlyFans? They want to have, like basketball players or like actors sell be able to sell like exclusive access like behind the scene videos and build relationships that way is that what they're pivoting to but it seems like they already have the market's already been decided for them and they're going away from it it's it's definitely interesting well it is for sure and i mean listen it's that's a site that's been there for people in some tough times i know i said i didn't have an account remus did sell a few feet picks on the month yeah, between okay. tsn going down and and us starting with a big sports talk but uh, hey sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do uh all right let's finish this off we have our canadian club i love rye package ready to go for a marlboro race i know that michael remus has been setting it up uh folks hit us uh give us a thumbs up and Start starting off right now. <laughs> uh, the chat's having fun this afternoon. Uh, starting off right now, Bart Remus, you tell me when you're ready to uh, start getting in yeah. the names, and I'll start firing them out. If you want to, just put in that you're here and you're in Winnipeg or in the general area and can come into the city to pick up the package at some point. Um, you let me know when you're ready to go, and I'll start reading out some uh, some names. Okay, I am. Um... Uh, I'm just getting settled in here. And now my I'm typing on a different keyboard. My, the A key for my regular keyboard is Dunbar. So, Oh, did you get a new key, uh, keyboard uh, during I'm, the show? I'm just, I have two computers here, so I'm using uh, Well here. done. Well done. I will, uh, yeah, if you want to start. I got all my keys here, so I can type pretty quick. So just start. Okay, perfect. I'm going to start firing up. Okay, Bardo, you said you've never been in. We're going to start with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, BA is here. Leighton, uh, well, we'll put you in, but if you win, you're like us. You're not winning because I already have a prize. You won last week and we'll hook that up very, very soon. I mm -hmm. have it in my, uh, in my possession. All right. We got Frosty. Uh, we got Sean Gagne, Rob Mahoney, uh, BA Split, Chris Vermette, Waiters 27, Dallas, David LaFantasy, Bravo Bry. Uh, Kenny's Water Bottle, Frosty, uh, Heart Gaming. I Heart Gaming. Are you in Winnipeg? Yeah, he is. Uh, okay, they you're are. in. I don't, uh, are, yeah. They are. Uh, Sean Lishka, the Gitch, is with us. B A. Okay, Leslie Mitchnuck, uh, Albane Bale, Comet, Les Thompson, CC and Ginger is awesome. Les, that might be the sort of karma you need to win this. And again, another great take. I like WFT right there with me. Uh, there's my guy, Jason Jett. What up, Jay? Good luck in the DraftKings this weekend. Uh, we move down to, okay, Eagle Eyes, Schickster, Travis, um, Matty Patty, 2002, Mark Sports Video, Dan S., uh, Wayne Jones, Wayne, we're going to put you in, but, uh, if you win, I don't know, it might be tough to pick up from Norway. Uh, Travis is here. Travis is in Winnipeg Jets forever. What's up, Max? Uh, running man, Marilee Gurrell. Hi, Marilee. You're always here listening. We'd love having you here with us. Thanks so much. Uh, Bart Omond, uh, Paul Salmon. Anyone else that I missed? Tracy Okraniak. Hi, Trace. Uh, we got Kenny's water bottle, Justin F. Tacos are sandwiches. 
<laughs> Winnipeg Chaster. Chris Vermette. I think we got Bart Omond in already. Yeah, we got those guys in. Uh, Bartholomew. Great White Nation. Uh, Schickster. Oh, James Alestra. Jet Oil Tom. Dan S. Spencer Sutton. Uh, did I get you Rob Mahoney already? Yeah, it will Mitch the Godfather. Oh, the Godfather for sure. Uh, Kitty Pup 1000. It. And I think I pretty much went through everybody. All right, so let's just go back to the bottom if I've missed anyone. Do, do, do. Oh, Stefan Marshall. Did we get Stefan? We'll get him in. And uh, Kitty Pup and, uh, oh, and Larry then, uh, Eloy. Do, do, do. Oh, and Manny Fran and really Eloy, everyone at the bottom. Okay, I got Manny. I got a bunch of them. I, I put a bunch of those in as well. I think you said like Dan S like three times. So I only I only put him in in one, but I got okay, all those. Okay, that makes that's fair. That's fair. All right, gang. Remus has picked the track. Uh, I, I have another I love rye package for you, including some delicious Canadian club, the good stuff, uh, as well as uh, some bomber socks, some I love rye glasses. Um, but, uh, yeah, bottle of CC, which will make for a great weekend, uh, going forward, or maybe, uh, you know, a few drinks before a bomber game coming up. And of course you can always get the great taste of Canadian club and all the other beam Suntory ba brands everywhere in IG field. Commissioner Remus, what, uh, what do we have today for a track? Uh, I tested this one yesterday. Beautiful. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. I just got my wife just uh, dropped oh. me off a smoothie. I don't know if you heard the oh. heard the vitamins. Oh. oh, delicious! Hi there, Leah. Uh, Justin F. Have tried the black cherry CC. Hmm. I just found out about the black cherry CC, and this is a little insider secret. The only place you can get that on the planet is Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Apparently, that came out a few years back. And, you know, it kind of came and went. And for whatever reason, people love it here. And it is still made and only sold in these two provinces. I learned that yesterday. So um, we've got the regular CC, but at some point, maybe we will do that Black Cherry CC. I did not even know that it existed. But yes, it does. I saw it yesterday. And that is truly a prairie thing. That 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 They should do something with that for Labor Day Classic and Banjo Bowl. Uh, because that is the heart of the Black Cherry Canadian Club territory. Uh, all right, Remo, how are we doing? We're doing great. I got them all entered in. Um, here, we can do this. We'll slide in here. I tested this track yesterday. I know how to drive it. It is called Twists and Turns. We have 48 people in here, and we can load this. Thing. But yeah, I've been doing, you know, I know we're doing these on Friday, so I do have them all, all in. Mm. this is great a great way to finish up it's been an awesome show this week again thanks to everyone that has been with us and uh, for those of you that are uh, here with us on the daily basis we thank you so much uh, but you yeah, spread the word let people know where they can find us there might be some people going yeah what's a podcast or i don't get youtube uh do them a favor just grab their phone show them the little purple thing how they put in winnipeg sports talk or on youtube hit that red subscribe button and uh tell them to join us every weekday here at one o'clock and Usually should be in your podcast feed by about 3.30 for your drive home. But if you are listening on the podcast, sometimes you don't get the fun of the live show, which of course is this when we do a marble race at the end of Friday. Uh, Remo, you want to get us started? Sure, I'll fire this thing up. All, All right, right. Here, here we go, folks. A little Friday afternoon marble race for Canadian Club. Good luck to everyone. And I love rye packages on the line and everyone is in to the funnel to begin the festivities. I see Mara Lee, Rob Mahoney in there near this front. Larry Eloy, Bravo Bry. This is always interesting to see who gets down first. I love these physics-based games. All sorts of games. Okay, yeah, Rob Mahoney out and go. Oh, there's Bardo, who I think was the first person we put into the race Mary Lee's there. Bart Omond is there as well. Gitch Lishka is in the mix. There's a guy that I know would be a perfect winner of the I Love Rye package because of people that I know personally. I'm not sure there's anyone that actually loves rye more than one Gitch Lishka. 
Steinbach's second manliest man, by the way, for 2021, if you uh, if you didn't know. All right, we do have a leader. Oh, Jason Jett's now into the league. Nope, Merrily's there. Bardo is there. Bart Omond. Those are our top three. Rob Mahoney is right there. But Mara Lee is out in front with the lead. Rob Mahoney in. Oh, Mark Sports Video is making a run as well. Look at Mark. I think he's into third, but they are all chasing Mara Lee. We'll see which direction Mara Lee goes when she comes out of this tunnel. Got slowed down a little bit. I think Bardo's got a little bit more speed right now. Bardo's in the right. Kenny's water bottle now ahead on the left. Uh, but again, we do have an obstacle here. Let's see who gets through this red. Oh, Rob Mahoney takes advantage. Gitch Lishka now with a bit of a heater. Gitch is in the lead, it looks like. You can just feel the excitement here, folks, at the WST Marble Stadium. Gitch Lishka, very, very close right now. He's into the lower level. What do we have? Oh, and it's Gitch Lishka as the winner. Oh, if there was ever a more perfect winner, a guy that loves rye, maybe more than life itself, the winner of our I Love Rye package on a Friday afternoon. Oh, God, I can already see this. I'm going to get a DM in about 15 minutes. Yeah, I, I called off work tonight. I can come by and pick up the CC right away. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> wow, that was great. Yes, the second manliest man was the fastest marble on a, on any given Friday, they say, Remus. Any given Friday. And here's Paul Simin. Took his sweet time today in finishing it up. Gitch Lishka with the win. Oh, wow. That was a great track. That was a great track. There were lots of twists mm. and turns, some ups and downs. Woo! Well, folks, um, we all congratulate Gitch Lishka. Uh, he will be a very happy recipient of the I Love Rye package. Leighton Janice won last week. I got you hooked up as well. And we do have to thank uh, our guy James Hart over at Canadian Club uh, for joining us. And we're going to be working on some other really cool prizing with Canadian Club. Of course, they are the official sponsor of the Bombers. So it gives us some cool Bomber stuff to give away. Uh, but again, you can't give out an I Love Rye package without some rye. And that, of course, is the good stuff. Canadian Club, there is nothing better. Um, well, I'm exhausted from that. The uh, the ups and downs of that final marble race was an incredible way to finish up the program. If you haven't already, folks, do us a favor. If you're with us in the YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. If you're watching on a mobile, you just have to close the chat, hit the thumbs up. You can go back in. Um, tomorrow, of course, Bombers and Argonauts, a three o'clock kickoff. We should give some love to our pal Darren Bombing, Remo, because uh, Bombing has been doing a great job getting you ready for Bomber games. And I think early, sometime tomorrow morning on the Bonfire Sports YouTube channel, Bombing will throw out the latest edition of Game Day Winnipeg, where he'll be breaking it down with the great Chris Walby. That will be a, a fun look, on, look out on YouTube before we get to the game tomorrow at 3 p.m., and then uh, Monday, 1 p.m., we will break down the entire big weekend for the Bombers, for the Canadian Football League, and so much more. Uh, Remo, what's up for the weekend for you? Any big plans? Man, I don't know. It's like raining. So I'd go to the zoo. I'm probably going to be in Winnipeg. I'm not going out. Um, no plans. I have no, I, I have no plans scheduled. So that, that's the bottom line. Uh, nothing. So we will see what we can do. It depends on the rain. Yeah, waiters, waiters, easy money for Huston Remus tonight when Montreal wins. Hopefully, hopefully. Yes, I am I'll, on Montreal on the money liner. And we got a great number, certainly much better than right mm. now. But if there's one thing we know, when it, everything seems like it's obviously going one way, yes, it will often go the other. So uh, not counting any chickens before they hatch. But I did get a nice win on the Elks money line last night. It was a, some tense moments there in the fourth quarter, uh, but a hell of a four-minute offense for the Elks to shut down the lions at the end of the uh, the game all right everyone we gotta get these podcasts up for people listening to on the drive home congratulations to gitch thanks to everyone that joined us today have yourselves a wonderful weekend we will be back at one o'clock on monday to get it going for another week here on winnipeg sports talk daily make sure you're subscribed for those that are listening on the podcast rate and review always appreciated and most importantly 
Tell a friend Monday. We'll let you know about the new item, a little collab we've done with Royal Sports. Very excited to tell you about that. So uh, you can think about that all over the weekend. Folks, thank you for everything. Have a great weekend. We'll see you tomorrow or see you Monday on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. We're up. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.